on live now, you should be good. And great. Well, noting the time, 6.13, welcome Six Nations community, welcome to our technicians and welcome to the council. Um, looking to um, get our proceedings started. Um, is there uh, any changes, deletions um, for the agenda? So looking to get a mover for the agenda. I'll move that. Move by Kerry, seconded by Melvin. Melba, sorry. Is there any uh, amendments, deletions, changes to the agenda? Seeing none, going to the vote, all in favor? Any opposed? No opposed, uh, that motion has passed. Um, moving on to item number four, delegations and presentations. I see we have the Royal Canadian Air Cadets and looking for Captain Stephen Young. Captain Young? Yeah, I'm here. How's it going? Hello. Welcome. Uh, thank you. You're having a great okay. evening. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, can, I, oh. can I interrupt a little bit? Are you going to do the media? Oh, I thought I did do the media. Just looping back, um, no. just an identification of media. Uh, Victoria Gray from the Turtle Island News. Thank you. Thanks for that, Melba. And I don't You're see welcome. Turtle Island. Oh, sorry, I see Turtle Island. I don't see two row times. Okay. Sorry about that. So next we'll move right into Captain Young's presentation. I see we have you on the agenda for about 30 minutes, um, uh, if you're even going to take that long. So what I'll do is I'll quickly pass that over to you. If you need a uh, share screen, let us know and we'll, um, we'll make those capabilities available to you. I, sh I should be okay. I, I mainly oh. have to talk, so. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Um, thank you very much for everybody to, uh, to inviting me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll give a little short presentation. I, I believe everyone received the letter that I'm going to be referencing, so I'll try to keep the, um, the presentation short since this did come in by letter uh, that I sent a few months ago. Um, so by name, way of introduction, my name is uh, Captain Stephen Young. I'm the commanding officer of 715 Mohawk uh, Air Cadet Squadron in Burlington. I uh, took that position last year in the middle of the pandemic. So this has really been kind of the first year that we've been able to start operating and uh, having them in person. Um, a cadet, the cadet program, just so everyone knows, is a youth program for kids age 12 to 18. Um, we teach leadership, citizenship, physical fitness, uh, among, among other things. And the program itself is a partnership between the Canadian Armed Forces uh, and the Civilian Air Cadet League. When I took over this squadron, um, I noted a few interesting things, uh, in particular, the name and the crest. And that's kind of what I wanted to bring. Um, it's my understanding that about five or six years ago, this came to, uh, I'm not sure who, certainly the chief at the time, but possibly the council, I assume. Um, and this came up as a discussion and we were granted, it's just over my shoulder, actually, an eagle's feather and permission to uh, continue with the name. but. I really felt that within the context of recent events and peace and reconciliation that this needed to be discussed again. So I've kind of brought three questions that I was hoping that we could discuss or um, however the, the council sees fit. Um, question number one is the name. Um, as you've already heard, obviously the name of the unit, the nickname of the unit is Mohawk. Um, we don't own that name, obviously. I don't need to tell you that. Uh, it belongs to the community and I wanted to renew that permission or at least discuss whether or not the community was comfortable with our use of that name. Related to that, um, we have not had any ongoing connections. Sorry? No. Related to that, we have not had any ongoing connections with the community. And if we retain that name, I certainly would like to have some connections that we could build that. Like I would like to I don't know exactly what that looks like, but certainly visits, education with the cadets and the community, all of that. The third item is the crest. And I, I think perhaps this is the most problematic. 
it's come to my attention that um, the crest as it's currently designed was draw, drew, drawn by an indigenous member of the community. Um, but, you know, it's times change, understandings change. And in the context, I wanna make sure that we don't have a crest that is um, disrespectful in any way. And I wanna make sure that we honor any connections we have. For context, I believe the name is a reference to Joseph Brandt. I think that's where it comes from. Um, but you know that's the past, and I want to make sure that we're doing everything we can be to do res to be respectful. Um, I can bring if you want me to share the screen and bring up the crest, I can do that. Uh, it was on the letter, so and it's if you just go to the squadron's website, sub one five mohawk dot com, it'll come or dot ca, it'll come up. I think that's it for just presentations. Um, it's really me coming for. Uh, consultation with the community to see what uh, what we can do going forward and the comfort level of the community. So at this point, I'm going to listen. Thanks, Captain Young. And um, th thanks for the approach too, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, understanding and, and knowing where to go and, and who to talk to in, in relation to these matters. It's certainly, certainly appreciated at the high level. Um, so with that presentation, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Council to see if there's uh, any responses, immediate responses, or uh, any uh, sort of kind of process uh, pieces that, that we could look at in terms of um, responding to, to the letter. I see Wendy. And then Helen. So uh, I'll I'll dive in. <laughs> so <laughs> thanks very much, Captain Young, for coming forward. And and I too appreciate that uh, you you extended that outreach to us to have this this dialogue. Um, I, I've got a few questions about it, and I understand you know cadets with its you know its youth that that's the focus and and going forward. One of the things even coming to us regarding the name because we're Six Nations. There are Six Nations here. Mohawk is, is one of them. Um, so if you're looking for the name, I think it goes beyond just here, Six Nations. And, and I'm guessing it's because of the, the area being Burlington, this is the closest community. But if you're looking at, you know, Mohawk, there are a few more Mohawk communities specifically within, certainly within Ontario and, and beyond. That's one piece of it. The other one is we have veterans in our community and maybe there's some discussion there that we should be um, having and seeing what the veterans think of it. This is you know, their, their area. When I look at the logo and I'm not sure what transpired or the conversation with previous councils or chiefs or what have you, but there's a lot going on in that logo. You know, it's not only the, um, it's not only the headpiece, the um, the picture itself, but you've got you know the Canada flag behind it. You've got the crown on it. You've got <laughs> there are a lot of things going on. Uh, talk, you know that reference some col colonial history, and talking about reconciliation and talking about the TRC and talking about all of those things. There's a bit of a contradiction going on there. Um, so and I don't know just even with you know, rural Canadian air cadets. I mean, cadets is one piece, but because of the partnership you have, if you're looking at reconciliation, I don't know if there's been any work done to look at the history or the role of those partners with residential school, with what happened at the Mohawk Institute, because, you know, if, if you look through the archives, there were a lot of organizations and institutions that were actually involved in apprehending children and and moving children and, and so on. So that may be a, a starting point on that reconciliation side and, and going further. But I think there's, I think the point I'm, I'm making is there's some bigger conversation even beyond this table, that, that's how I feel anyway. I don't feel I'm in a position to say, yes, go ahead and use the Mohawk name. Um, I think that's beyond me. There's the Confederacy, um, uh, Confederacy Council as well. So, um, there's a lot more to it, I think. Thanks for Wendy and, and good comments in terms of uh, advice um, going forward on, on a number of these fronts. Uh, Helen, I saw you with your hand up. Uh, 
Um, yeah, in terms of the name, I don't have a problem with the name. I mean, if you look in the phone book, there's all kinds of things named with Mohawk. Mohawk Mechanicals, Mohawk this, Mohawk that. So I don't have a problem with the name. I'm not so sure about the crest. Um, I couldn't see the significance of the crest, at least not the way it is. Um, I guess, I don't know, was that supposed to be a Mohawk chief? Or <laughs> I don't know what, who he was supposed to be, but, and I don't know what council approved it. None of the councils that I've sat on in 18 years ever had to ever approved anything that I know of. So I don't know what council put that in place, but I, that's, that's just my comment. I don't have a problem with the name, but I do have a bit of questions about the, the crest. I'm not, I don't know if I'm um, too happy with that, or I don't know if I'm, I just, when I seen it, I was kind of taken aback a bit because I was trying to figure out what it had to do with cadets. And then it, got, it came to my head, it's got to be a Mohawk chief or something. I, I'm assuming that's what it is. And I don't know what that has to do with cadets. So, no, I don't. And like Wendy said, it's up, I guess it's up to a lot of people, but you're coming and asking us. And my response to you is I don't support the crest, but I don't care about, I, support, I don't, I have no issue with the name, but I don't support the crest. If you want to take it to the community, that's up to you. If you want to take it to the, the, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy Chiefs Council, that's up to you. But you're coming to us and you're asking us what we think. And I'm telling you what I think. That's, that's what I would like to hear. I, I am, I'm coming to you because and I, I think it was placed at the beginning that I, I don't know else, where else to go, to be honest. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I found the, the closest community was either um, yourself or the Mississaugas of the New Credit, but I felt that this was sort of the direction we were, we, that was best to go. And I, when I started this, my biggest concern was the crest. I look at that crest and I feel like it is not respectful. I feel like it's a PR issue, honestly, for us. <laughs> Um, the center of the crest is the part we can change. The, the crown and the outside is sort of a, it's a fixed frame, so to speak. Um, the name came up later and um, I think there may be an issue with the name, but I also think there may not be. Like, as I pointed out, there's a long history of relationships and, and veterans and these sort of things, but these aren't decisions that I want to make. I want to know, you know, where to, where I can appropriately go um, to, to fix these issues, right? And I, I don't know of the history of the cadet program and residential schools. I haven't looked into that. And to be honest, that would be very challenging to research, but very interesting to research. And I, and I would find that fascinating, to be honest. So I'm sorry if I stepped in, I just, I wanted to respond to some of the comments. No, no, I think it's good. and and. I think we're talking more about process and perspectives because as both Wendy and, and Helen pointed out, there's, there's others that, that should be weighing in on this um, going forward. Um, and, and I really like the suggestion about using utilization of the, the First Nation veterans that are out there um, because they, they've lived and breathed all of this um, and in terms of uh, their sacrifice and their commitment. Um, and, and doing so in a respectful way. Um, I don't think we're, we're passing the buck. Uh, we just wanna make sure all perspectives are covered going forward on, on this particular piece. So maybe that is kind of what I would, uh, and, and what I think I'm hearing as recommendations is, is going out and, and seeking those, those additional perspectives. And that's something we can, we can certainly help with. Um, you know, First Nation veterans being one, um, you know, um, but not overly asking everybody, right? Like, um, I, I think that's uh, doing so in a respectful manner. Um, Wendy, I see you, uh, you have your hand up. 
Yeah, I, I just want to ask uh, along with some of the comments that Helen was making, but but in terms of the Mohawk Squadron, like why Mohawk? Like where did that come from? Is there a history? Is there a story behind it? What's the contribution or the, um, the just just the backstory on that? Um, I honestly don't know, and I've tried to do that research, and I and I honestly don't know. There's, uh, I think, about 50 years of history for this particular squadron uh, in the community. And um, this crest is, I believe, as I've been, I've been able to find the second crest. The first one was even worse. Um, why, the, why this? The best, best answer I can give you, uh, as far as I can tell, is Burlington has this um, strong connection or love of Joseph Brandt. So I'm guessing that it's in reference to an honor to Joseph Brandt. Um, would be my guess, um, but that's uh, that's just from talking to people. The the cadet squadrons are not often the greatest at keeping records and keeping history. Unfortunately, um, staff change frequently. We're obviously a youth organization, so there's not like a history book I can consult. Unfortunately, I've only been at the unit for a couple of years now. So, just just to follow up, just I mean. Maybe if you don't know the history, I mean, what do you propose going forward of what it can be and what is that, you know, paying, paying homage to the name or something, I, I don't know. I mean, it, I think others need to weigh in on it, but, uh, but for sure, I think the crest should, should go. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't, I believe the crest should go, but I'm hesitant to change it without consultation from um, the community, whether it be this community or a broader um, community. Like I said, I, I'm going where I, I, I'm starting with you. <laughs> um, and thank you, thank you for having me, like I said. Um, and I, I would need advice as to the next step for sure. I, I think the crest is pro extremely problematic. Um, the name, I don't know what to say about the name, to be honest. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm going to go back to listening. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm going to go to Helen and then um, see if there's any any other comments. Helen, yeah, I guess my thinking is if you have if you're obviously having problems with the name, you're obviously having problems with the crest. You've come in here voicing your concerns about those two. If you have concerns about these two things, then do something and get rid of them. Change them. You're the one who has concerns with it because that's why you're here. And if you have concerns with it, then change the name and change the crest. That's all you have to do. <laughs> you don't have to talk to anybody. Just I'll, change I'll, it. I'll, I'll tell you why I started this this way rather than just making change. And I, and I appreciate that. I, I really do. Um, there's a couple of reasons I, I did this. One is because of, like I said, what's over my shoulder. This comes from, from what I'm told, bring it down. I'm told from uh, Chief uh, Ava Hill, Ava Hill, I'm, I'm told that this came from. So I don't want to make changes where consultation has already occurred and risk disrespecting anybody by making those changes. So I'm hesitant to just unilaterally make changes. I think there is also some love of the name. And if the name can be kept in a respectful way, in a way that we use it as an opportunity to honor that connection and use it as an opportunity to engage with the community, I think that's beneficial. Um, and then, you know, the crest would change following that. But if the community feels that, you know, we shouldn't bear that name for reasons of colonialism, reasons of connections to the Mohawk Institute uh, that I'm unaware of, but for whatever reason, you know, then we would just change everything, right? I just, given, the previous history, I didn't feel like it was right for me to make a unilateral decision on that. Thanks, Captain Young, and, and certainly appreciate that uh, in terms of the, the history. And I think we're keying in on, on kind of that as, as being one of the fundamental pieces for moving forward is understanding the history of, you know, the, the crest in the name. Um, Hazel. Yeah, I hear you, Hazel. Okay. Um, so I thought I had something before Hazel. Oh, Christopher. Um, Christopher, did you still have your hand up? Uh, yes, thanks, Councillor. Uh, I was just going to say I've known over uh, my years a number of people who went through various cadet units, and many of them got a lot out of that experience. So I was just going to ask uh, what kind of efforts the, the Mohawk unit has actually made to offer that 
opportunity to Mohawk and Six Nations youth. Have there been any efforts to reach out to youth in the community to offer that experience to them? So as far as I can tell, unfortunately, no. Um, again, I've only been with this unit for two years. Um, last year was we were entirely online. Um, and this year um, was we started in October and I started this process over the summer. So and, and luckily I've gotten here. Um, I think that's something that is lacking. I think it was try. I think that my two COs ago, so this would have been about five years ago, I think there were outreaches and there were attempts. And I think that this is why this is half the, the, the feather, for example, the eagle feather. But in the past four years, I don't think anything has happened. And that was part of my outreach was consultation on the name, consultation on the crest. But in addition, also, if we're going to maintain those connections, um, can we build those connections, you know, and can we learn how to reach out and how to build those connections? Because I don't want to carry this name if we're not doing something about it, if it's not embedded in um, everything we operate. So. Thanks for that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, Councillor Wright, I, I forgot to mention something uh, that's somewhat salient. Um, I came across years ago uh, another cadet unit that was connected to uh, uh, to a, a community uh, out in British Columbia, actually. It's a, it's a Sikh unit, um, but it seems that there's a key difference. The, the Sikh unit, I believe it's called the Bai Kanaya uh, Army uh, Cadet Unit, um, is mostly Sikh. It, it's formed of Sikh youth and their uniforms reflect um, Sikh culture. Uh, it's not exclusive to Sikhs, so um, non-Sikh youth can join it as well, but it's mostly Sikh youth, as I understand it. Um, and that seems to be uh, a key difference here. But I know that the Baikanaya Cadet Unit uh, makes a very uh, intent effort to, to reach out to that community and to, uh, to offer that experience to them. Thanks for that, Christopher. And, and I'm, I'm hearing some good recommendations. And, and we'll go to Hazel, and then we'll look to wrap this up. Uh, and because uh, we are getting to the 6.35 uh, time frame. So Hazel, you yeah, have the floor. Yeah, I'm just thinking that the crest, I haven't seen it, so, but I am going to make a comment. But if you like the name of the current name is of Mohawk, why don't you just keep it like Helen said? Um, as for the crest, if, if you have a crest, that's got a maple leaf on it. And it's also got the name of Mohawk. It's like, well, oil and water, they don't, they don't jive together. So I'm gonna suggest that for a crest and in respect of say the Six Nations veterans, veterans everywhere, if you had um, the Mohawk on there and then have like everything is uh, sort of in a circle of unity to, to um, in, indicate unity. So if you had maybe a, a Mohawk and then the unity of veterans going around a circle of the crest, like to tie it into that, the full meaning of what Mohawk would indicate. I think I, I can hear like what Helen was saying. I haven't seen the crest, so I'm just summarizing what I've uh, thought while she was talking. Um, so if you could um, incorporate maybe veteran like symbols around the outside that would show honor to the veterans because a cadet is really the beginning of learning to be, uh, you know, maybe in the army or whatever. Just uh, my, uh, oh, sorry. Just my thoughts. Can I take a moment to share the image? I, I seem to have sharing ability. So Pretty that hand. would be beneficial. So there it is. The, the outside is a frame. So the crown and the, the name at the bottom is a frame that doesn't change, it's the inside that we have control over that we can change. So, and I, I understand the oil and water comments very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I don't want to take over, so I think everyone's seeing that. I'm going to turn that off and yeah. get back control. <laughs> Thanks for that, uh, Captain Young. And, and I'm hearing some few things, so I'm just going to wrap this up. Um, but I'm hearing some good good ideas for your consideration. Um, uh, and in terms of, uh, I feel there's there's probably some public education and awareness around the residential schools. And and what what I'm going and narrowing in on that is is the combination of the crown and and the the, the image, um, not necessarily being um, respectful given this this time period that we're in um, with with those types of relations. So it's it's those kind of things to kind of consider and and as you consider uh, your own actions going forward, I think the other piece would be. Um, to, to look and come up with uh, a good understanding of the history of the name, uh, Mohawk Squadron. What is it, 715? Yeah, 715. Yeah. Um, and, and from there, um, I think to there is uh, that need to have uh, more extended dialogue beyond us. Um, you know, we do have a Veterans Association in, in Six Nations that. Uh, that uh, you, they'd probably be happy to talk to you about uh, a lot of these things because they have another perspective as well. So I'm hearing two things, recommendations. There's, there's education and awareness around uh, the history of, of us and, and Crown Relations, uh, as well as some um, outreach, uh, further outreach to uh, veterans associations, First Nations veterans associations to get their perspective. Uh, and also some uh, history around the significance of the, the gift of the feather. Um, as some of our counselors aren't aware of that, it would be good to kind of look at, look at that. So um, with that, um, if there's no further questions, um, I, I, I think that is the, the recommendations going forward. So um, I'm hearing some additional yeah. comments. So I'm gonna go to Melba. Just, just briefly, yeah, there's been some good comments. So that has been made. Uh, certainly there's many Mohawks, as was mentioned, in different communities. So if you're gonna do your research, you're gonna, you're gonna have to go far and wide, but uh, it has been suggested, you know, the veterans may be the, the appropriate uh, place to, uh, to uh, dialogue concerning um, what you're coming for, for tonight. And as for Joseph Brandt, there's different perspectives there too. So we have to be careful what we're doing because I'm a Mohawk and I'm sure other counselors are a Mohawk and and we have our different ways of thinking, but uh, I'm thinking of possibility of a unit here of cadets. How can we involve our youth as was mentioned specifically and, and our, our um, veterans may take on that role that's what I would be hoping, but uh, it sounds like the crest that it really is not appropriate to this, uh, what we're going through in, in our, our uh, communities concerning reconciliation and loss of life and so many other things that, that we're, we're dealing with to actually survive in our own community concerning cultural language and values and, and these kind of things. So. I certainly appreciate you coming forward with, with your concerns and uh, hopefully, as Nathan said, the recommendation will go to the veterans where they can have their voice too. Thank you. Thanks for that. Now, well, I think I saw Sherry Lynn with her. Yeah, and, and the recommendation is good. I just, I guess my thing is he came to us wanting help in the sense of, and we can tell him to go to the vets and we can go tell him to go here. I guess the whole part about it is it's it's this is a time where we can help um, make some changes in the sense of um, setting up the meeting with the key players or whoever and really having a good discussion about this for Captain for Captain Young because <laughs> again he's just grasping at straws himself and mm -hmm. let's give him, let's give him help here <laughs> you know it's call this person call that at least we can sit here and let's do it right. My, that's my thinking anyways and let's get the key players for this guy and um set up a meeting and invite who who we think and then he can he can talk to them and let's let's get some move forward on it that that's sounds all. the best that sounds the best sherry 
That's I, I, perfect. I, I really, sorry. No, I was just, and, and I had it noted to, to kind of do those next steps, but you guys beat me to it, so that's good. Um, so um, you heard the, the kind of next steps and uh, Captain Young, I'll leave you with the last word here, but I just wanted to kind of summarize that. So uh, my additional um, pieces was just a lot of what Sherry Lynn indicated is, is we're at your disposal in terms of being able to help coordinate, um, you know, meetings, uh, next steps, um, connecting you with with uh, the the right individuals so that you get you know this broader um, source of perspectives to kind of help guide you through this. Uh, so maybe if I can be so bold as to leave that with um, Chief Hill, he just joined us, uh, and his staff to kind of follow up uh, to make sure that you do get the meetings and, and the perspectives that you you have. Uh, and and then we'll take it from there. Um, so with that, I, I just want to thank you again for your respectful approach, bringing this to us, um, and uh, leave you with the last word. So Captain Ian, you have the floor. Um, so thank you very much. I, I really appreciate this, and, and thank you for uh, hearing me on this. Um, and any help would be greatly appreciated because I. I kind of laughed at grasping at straws. I don't think I'm quite that desperate, but I'm close there. <laughs> I, you know, I I started this outreach in, in August and I've been trying to find um, connections and find roots. And I really appreciate the opportunity to talk and it, it really would be helpful if there was somebody exactly on, on your staff who could maybe just help with the introductions and point me in the right direction because um, I want to do this respectfully, but I also want to do this obviously effectively and talk to the people that um, that need to be talked to. And even if we go about changing the crest, for example, I don't, you know, if the name is kept and the crest is changed, I don't want to sit and do that myself because I don't want to come up with something else that's disrespectful, right? We were talking about the mixing of the crown with the with the name and. I can't change the crown, so we gotta. I gotta work that through. Anyway, I, I think I'll just wrap up by saying I, I look forward to hearing, you know, to connecting who, with uh, whoever I can, and I, I greatly appreciate on behalf of myself and the squadron any help that uh, anybody can provide. And again, thank you very much for taking some of your valuable time to listen to me tonight and uh, to provide some recommendations and advice. I really do appreciate it. So thank you very much, and have a wonderful night, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, and just, I wanna just, in terms of the key contact uh, chief, um, is will Tammy be reaching out or should we leave this with Darren? I just wanna get that settled. So Captain Young is with a good contact. Hi, good evening and, and, and thank you. Sorry, I, I, uh, I, I got to catch a, a little bit of the conversation uh, towards the end there and just wanted to also uh, uh, recognize and, and say hello to Captain, Captain Young. I think it'd be okay if you could just uh, leave it with our office at this time and Tammy will reach up further. And if that changes, then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll advise at, at that point. But if you could just leave it with uh, Tammy and I, and, and we'll look to further uh, follow up. Thank you very much. Thank you so Perfect. much. Have a great evening. You too. Have a good night. Thank you. Perfect. Can I turn the chair back over to you, Chief? Perfect. Thank you so much, Nathan. I really appreciate that. Uh, apologize for running late, Council. Uh, so uh, just to um, continue on with the agenda under our delegation portion, I believe we have now the Greenland Group uh, in relation to a drainage presentation. Uh, sorry, I see, is it Mr. Hartman on the line? Yes. Hi, how are you, Chief Hill? I'm doing well, thank you. Thank how you. are you? Very good, thank you. Um, okay, so thank good. you. With sorry, that being Said, I'll, I'm going to pass the floor right over to yourself. If you need to do a share screen, you do have the ability to do that as well. So, now for being with us this evening. Thanks very much. So, again, thank you, Chief Hill and Council, for having us here tonight to to speak to you about uh, a project that's um, well, it's been ongoing probably over five years now, and um, and it's really culminated in a, a flood study and flood mitigation plan for. Uh, both Mackenzie Creek as well as Boston and Rogers Creek. So I'm not going to uh, spend too much time talking. I'm gonna, I have my colleagues here with me tonight. Um, our president and CEO, uh, Mark Palmer. And uh, doing most of the presenting tonight will be Don Moss, who's at the bottom of the screen there. Um, but I would like to begin with, uh, if I can, with a brief video that was prepared actually by 
uh, Six Nations staff, which introduced the project. So it gives you a bit of a, a one minute video that gives you an introduction as to where we started. And then Don will get into where, where we ended up with the, with the project overall. And is there supposed to be sound to this, or am I the only one that doesn't have sound? <laughs> yeah, I, can't I, I was just going to ask the same question. <laughs> that's a yeah, I'm not getting any sound, sound, Jim. Oh, okay. A, well, that's unfortunate. Technical difficulties. That's unfortunate. Okay, well, Don, I'm going to just turn it to you then to to carry on with the presentation. Are you able to share your screen? Uh, I believe so. Okay. Uh, if I can find uh, our presentation, then. That one picture looked like my old swimming hole. <laughs> I'll try and figure it out for the end of the uh, for the end of the presentation. Maybe I'll get to show it again. Uh, can everyone see the screen? Okay, great. Well, uh, we uh, are very appreciative of this opportunity to uh, uh, discuss the, uh, the two projects that we actually completed, which were the master drainage plans for Mackenzie Creek and for Boston and Rogers Creek. What we ended up doing as a flood mitigation strategy We've looked at benefits and costs of methodologies for how to determine the, the best way to screen different solutions. Uh, we uh, determined flood damage centers for Mackenzie Creek and for Boston Rogers Creek. And uh, we have some next steps that we will talk about. And we will, uh, with that, we have small communities fund. Flood mitigation strategy. I have a question. Yeah. So I don't know, uh, Mark or or others, just because community is, this is live stream and we do have a media. I'm not so sure that everybody understands where this is coming from. Oh, okay. um, so If this is just sort of a third party coming in or if there's a partnership or I see our old logo at the top of your, your deck, but... Um, so I think maybe two sentences or less would be helpful. Okay, sure. Uh, we were approached by the drainage committee uh, from Six Nations uh, back in 2015. And we helped prepare a strategy. Uh, Clint King was uh, instrumental in that at that time. And uh, this slide that you see here shows a full comprehensive plan that we discussed with the drainage committee, which included the first steps were to come up with a methodology of determining uh, flood prone areas within uh, Six Nations lands. And it would also lead to down the road uh, doing nutrient water balance modeling and source water protection and water budgets and water quality and uh, uh, it's quite a comprehensive plan that was put together. Uh, the area that's in the red 
dashed line is what we started with, with the original assignment. And uh, with the original assignment, it was decided by the committee that we would pick one of the rivers. And in this case, we did choose Mackenzie Creek to start off with. And uh, so in 2015, we did an analysis of Mackenzie Creek. The area in light green shows all of the drainage area that goes into Mackenzie Creek or any of its tributaries. And uh, then you have the second study that we did back three years ago now, uh, we did the study for Boston Creek and for Rogers Creek. And you see Boston Creek uh, in a light blue shading. And that uh, includes tributaries that are within six nations. And so there were flooding areas that we had to uh, evaluate that were on six nations land. And uh, Thanks, Don. Uh, that's a very good explanation of where we started from. Uh, perhaps, um, um, Councillor Johnson, you were asking why we're here tonight. Is that maybe the question? Or was it why, how we started with the project? No, it's just that we have community who are watching and just that little preamble as to what this is about. So the introduction to it. Yeah. Right, I apologize that video was intended to do that, but it didn't, obviously you couldn't hear it. So apologies again for that. Yeah, that, that's one of the challenges with uh, Zoom and, and the voice delay. Uh, so the flood mitigation strategy, uh, in order to determine the extent of flooding that you're going to have, you had to come up with accurate ways of determining the flows in the stream and we introduced all the standardized me methodologies that are, are been incorporated throughout all of the province. And uh, if you uh, approached the province and requested funds to come up with a floodplain analysis, these are the methodologies that would be applied. And uh, one of the, the main uh, deliverables with this assignment was to come up with a, a series of floodplain maps that would show the portions of each of your main creeks and tributaries that would experience flooding. And the drainage committee uh, identified several flood damage centers within uh, Six Nations lands uh, on both Mackenzie Creek and on Boston Creek. And these flood damage centers were, were derived by the number of houses in the vicinity of the creek or tributary that were susceptible to potential flooding. And this flooding could have taken place in several different ways. Either you had your, your driveways flooded out or your house was flooded, or as we presented at one time before, uh, you could either have your uh, septic tile fields or your wells impacted by flood levels as well. And so what we did is we identified a series of remedial solutions for each one of these flood damage centers. And we prepared a scoring system and we followed methodologies that are used uh, throughout the province and uh, recognized by the, by various uh, provincial agencies. And uh, then what we did is we, we prepared a benefit cost analysis uh, with some recommendations of some work to be done out there at a planning level to be, uh, to be uh, brought forth uh, with uh, any recommendations from, from council and uh, from uh, staff at Six Nations uh, to to determine how we are to proceed. So one of the, the main things, and I, I had the express privilege of coming alongside with several of these young men within the community. And we went out and we set up a methodology to survey every one of the culverts and bridge crossings that you have within Six Nations lands. And uh, also to, uh, 
produce extra cross sections on all of the main water courses underneath the, the water line because uh, where the Six Nations had uh, spent considerable revenues to, to bring in LIDAR mapping for all of the, the land, the LIDAR doesn't go underneath water. So we, were, we had to, um, to get extra survey information to assist with us to develop our computer models. And we also put in stream flow gauges and weather gauges uh, during the study. The benefit cost met methodology that we've used, as I said, uh, was developed by the province back in the 1980s. And so this same methodology is used uh, to uh, evaluate all projects in, within the province for, so if we did it this way, because uh, when you go to secure funding, the province would want to know how you did your calculations and we followed their methodology. So in essence, they have a document that was produced in the 1980s that said that you, each one of these buildings, you would have a certain value placed to it, recognizing that the building's gone up in value since the 1980s and then everything was brought up into present day dollars. With this slide, it shows it as $2,015, and that's when we did our original analysis for Mackenzie Creek. And so there were five flood damage centers that were identified on Mackenzie Creek, and it was actually not on Mackenzie Creek itself uh, predominantly, but on most of the tributaries. Uh, the first one was on both the upstream and the downside of, uh, downstream side of third line. There's about a 400 meter stretch that is very flat between Seneca Road and Mohawk Road. And the second that flood damage center was on the intersection of fourth line and Seneca Road. And uh, the, the, all the, the, the residences within uh, a certain distance from that road. The third one was uh, within the, the town of center of Oswegan, uh, just just up from the the hospital, where you have the lodge uh, with the, for the elders, and uh, flood damage center D was the the pumping station that's on fourth line, and there was a berm on the sewage lagoon that came under influence of the the flood flood water. So we looked at those with the first study that we did on Mackenzie Creek. Uh, this shows the picture of the areas that in orange where the flood damage centers are and the areas that are in blue, pale blue, that are, are, are the areas that are flood prone during uh, the most catastrophic uh, storm event that we have on record in the province, which is Hurricane Hazel. Uh, and the flood damage centers. Um, the first one up in the, in the top uh, left-hand corner is uh, damage center A1 and A2. And the area in pale blue is the, the flood spread that you would expect to get during that catastrophic flood event. And we evaluated uh, several options of uh, doing some uh, ditch, improvements and culvert upgrades to, to minimize the, the impact that they have for that area. Um, for damage center B was uh, intersection of fourth line and Seneca Road. Uh, former Chief Hill's uh, residence was uh, in that area. And uh, I know I, in a previous uh, study I teased her, I said that uh, the water was actually going to uh, give her a nice swimming pool in her backyard. Uh, but uh, uh, we discovered that with the, this, this particular area, that there were a couple of uh, driveway culverts that were backing up flows. And when they got opened up and, and expanded, it reduced fl flood levels significantly. And so there, there's a series of uh, channel improvements and some minor culvert work. And uh, that's what gets done for that one. Uh, 
down in the lower left hand corner, we have damage center C, which was uh, the main uh, Oswegan uh, town center. And uh, all the area in pale green is the area that would flood with this catastrophic event. And it would surround uh, the lodge that's just uh, north of the, uh, the hospital and the parking lot along the hospital. And then the next one is the pump station. Uh, the green dot is the pump station. And uh, this is along fourth line, not far from the, the, uh, the public works yards. And then you have the picture of the lagoon. You can see how the flood waters pitch against one of the uh, lagoon berms. So these were the five flood damage centers from Mackenzie Creek. And what we determined was their annual damages that you would expect using these provincial formulas. And then we projected what it would be if you didn't do any, any, if you had to keep on repairing it over and over again over the next 50 years. And these were the dollar amounts. And so that is uh, the flood damage centers for McKenzie Creek. Uh, so it was residences and properties that we looked at the lagoon, the pumping station, septic systems, public and private wells, and sewer systems. We did the same thing where we looked at the, the cost of the repairs versus the, and the benefits that you would get and uh, with uh, the damages that you are, are not having to uh, repair every year. And so any benefit cost ratio that comes out greater than one implies that there's a long-term benefit from the, 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 the work that when it originally gets done. So you can see that the cost to do the, the repairs, uh, though they're, they're fairly substantial numbers, that the amount that you're going to save in, in, in repairs over the 50 year period start to make many of these projects quite beneficial especially the ditch improvements around Oswegan Village Center. You notice that there's a, th a 30 times uh, uh, benefit to the, the cost of doing the repairs. And so as we continue on, the second study we ended up doing in concert with the Mississaugas of the New Credit uh, had five flood damage centers as well on Boston Creek, but three of them highlighted in yellow are the ones that were in Six Nations. And those are the three in the, on the north end of the, the top end of the, the figure. There's, they're on third line uh, on Ondega and also on um, second line. And so in those, the one on third line we, we started presenting the information differently in the second study. We, we started doing more graphics where we had color code coded pictures for all the different solutions that were being considered by the drainage committee. And the one that was selected is the green line that runs through the, all of the properties. And it is an improvement of the channel make it to keep all the floodwaters within uh, a prescribed area that could be easily managed by all the homeowners. The diversion schemes that we looked at were all very expensive. So they got screened out pretty quickly. Uh, flood damage center C at the bottom of the screen was four houses on uh, Onondaga Road north of second line. The area in pale blue is the backwater from the main river and it comes all the way up the Onondaga Road and it actually backs up onto the properties of the four homes. So uh, we thought that we were going to have to do some channel improvements around the homes, but it ended that the best thing to do is to do some flood proofing for the, the, the individual homes. And we looked at the, something similar with uh, damage center D and uh, the area in pink shows the full flood extent that we would have and it got reduced down to the area in sort of a grayish color with the improvements that we proposed for culverts and for some ditching. And so those are the three projects on Boston Creek that, that are also included in 
the studies that we've done. And again, the, the, we have three different solutions. And in this particular case, uh, the Mississaugas wanted, uh, of the new credit wanted the, the individual house service improvements added to the flood mitigation costs. And so that brought down the, the uh, benefit cost ratio. Uh, in each case, uh, these are uh, uh, hefty price tags, but uh, you're, you're, you are saving quite a bit over to 50 years in, in repairs. And uh, the best project was the uh, flood damage center D. So you, it, we end up with a 2.6 uh, benefit cost ratio for some culvert upgrades and channel improvements. So the next steps are required tasks to implement all of these uh, master drainage plan uh, recommendations. And they include uh, for each area that is being considered for repairs uh, to go out and do the full topographic surveys of each area, including getting all of the elevations for all of the, the the houses in the area and the, the well heads and uh, the, where their tile fields are, get the geotechnical investigations done, uh, prepare the final design drawings, because these are everything that's done in the study has just been planning and it's uh, just lines on a, on a map. So you have to physically prepare the design drawings and get quotations and tenders before you go up get the work done. And then you need to get the acquired approvals there's construction, including engineering inspection, to ensure the work is done in accordance with the design, and then the final project reporting to the committee and and council. And small communities fund is something that I think what we can do is uh, I think uh, Jim can probably take over and talk about that. Sure, if, you, <clears throat> if you just want to move through to the next slide, Don. So we did. Uh, at the time at the request of council make application to small communities fund um, which does fund these types of projects and and we did have a successful application specifically for the projects on Mackenzie Creek <clears throat> next slide Don. and so we were successful in securing five hundred thousand dollars worth of funding from the uh, combined from the federal and provincial governments um, um, now this does require a contribution from Six Nations to, to get that funding. Um, and uh, we did get some extensions um, through, through Michael Montour, who's made requests to Small Communities Fund uh, to have an extended or extension to the, the funding uh, up to the end of December of next year. So that's when those funds would need to be spent if, uh, if we're going to use those funds from the federal and provincial government to address some of the issues that we identified in Mackenzie Creek or all the issues that we identified in Mackenzie Creek and address those so that uh, those areas are no longer funded or excuse me flooding. So I think that was it. Um, I know that was a lot of information in a very short period of time. It did take us uh, five years to get to that point. So, uh, so yeah, there is quite a bit of information, but we're happy to answer any questions that um, through you, Chief Hill, that council may have on on this uh, on this on this information pre presented tonight. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for for providing that presentation. Uh, if I could just request that if you can uh, take down your share screen, uh, oh. and we'll look to open uh, the floor up for any questions or comments uh, for anyone on the line. I see uh, Councillor uh, Wendy, uh, I see a number of hands. I'll start with Councillor Wendy and then I'll shift through to the remaining. Thank, thanks Mark and thanks for the presentation. So I, I just found it difficult because of the, the mapping, I was looking for some sort of context in, in the locations, you know, looking at upstream, downstream, third line, looking at uh, uh, Smooth Town. Are we talking about five kilometers, 10 kilometers? What's the stretch of housing? Are there blue numbers? So are we talking about five homes, 10 homes, 
30 homes, it, it would have been good to have some sort of context behind that and what's being applied. And when I look at the um, the budget, so we're sitting on 500,000 right now, and I don't know the 250,000 from Six Nations. I don't know if that's an old commitment from someplace else or that's sitting in the public works budget. It's already been planned for and allocated. So if we have 500 or 750,000, but the cost is much higher than that. So what is the plan? What's the priority list if we're moving forward with this? What is that? I don't see that any place. Sure, so those are all great questions. Um, so with respect to the, uh, I don't know, Don can probably reshare his screen or I, I can if you would like, but um, the, uh, the projects, Don, that, in, that include the 750, if you wanna go back to the Mackenzie Creek slides for the, for the uh, cost of works. Or would you like me to do that? I'm just in loading it up. Okay. And then in the meantime, Michael, I don't know if you wanted to speak to the um, to the commitment to the small communities fund. I think I'll leave that question to you. Thank you. And thanks for the presentation. Um, right now, we don't have uh, any funds set aside at the moment. Um, something we can look at with the budgeting coming up for the next fiscal year, but. Um, yeah, there, there are, the main barrier I think we face is the property access. Um, so there's a, there's a number of properties that are impacted and uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the work involves trenching onto private property. So that was one of the main barriers which led to um, this being put off for so long. Um, the other being, of course, you know, COVID, everything kind of stopped. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, this was, this whole presentation, I was asked to organize uh, an update to council so that uh, to bring everyone up to speed and as a kind of a refresher um, out of a lot of the drainage issues that we experienced with the, the heavy, heavy rainfall in the fall here um, and all the drainage issues. So there is an overall plan made, but um, it's about execution at this point and a little more planning on our end. Okay, Don, did you find that? I uh, just I just oh, my apologies. We have a number of other speakers that I want to get to as well, but I'll uh, just do a subsequent follow-up question. It looks like Wendy, and then I'll look to uh, the remaining speakers list. Yeah, I, I just want to know because the gentleman presented that there's 500,000 and there's been an extension to December 2022. So if we have that 500,000, that's what I think I'm hearing. We don't have any other. And if we have that's pending a contribution from us, I think we need to know that. And then I was looking at the summary cost benefit analysis and it adds up to a lot. So if we're if we have to pick from that list, which one? That, that's all. But I know others have questions. Okay, great. Thank you. So would you uh, like us to so, through you, Chief Hill, would you like us to address the question with which projects are going to be included in that list? Yeah, yeah. What I'll do, uh, Jim, and thank you for that. Is I'll I'll look to obviously the the question from councillors first, and then look for uh, a coordinated response. So if you'd like to uh, respond good. to that question at the point in time, and then I'll look to our, our speakers list. Thank you, Marcus Hazel. Thank you, Hazel. I I have you in the list as well. Sorry, Jim. If you just want to respond to the last question from uh, Wendy. So you can see my screen this time. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So we were looking primarily at the uh, the projects that included the uh, the third line work, uh, upstream and downstream, as well as the fourth line work, and then there was some work associated with the Ashwigan project that was going to be included as well. So we have we have the application that indicates so or, so if I can just go to the cost of works. Okay, so um, so some of the works that included the um, the houses was was not included as part of the application. So some of the work that's included in 
in the services for the houses that you see in the totals for the flood damage centers A, B, and A and B, those some of those costs were not included. That was asked at that time by the drainage committee to leave those out and really just focus on the improvements to the channels and the box culvert works. So, so it's I don't have those numbers to present to you here tonight, but we could certainly through Michael provide that information to you, what the totals are for the channel improvements, the culvert improvements, and then the cost of works at Dushweekin Village was actually all included in that pro in that project. So I can give you a list of what was included in the actual application. If that's if you find that useful as a follow up. Yeah, most definitely appreciate that. Thank you, Jim, for yep. uh, for sharing and bringing your screen back forward. I'm going to go now at this point to the to our speaking uh, order. I, I have next Helen, Councillor Helen. Go ahead, because I think some of my questions have been answered. Okay. All right. Thank you, uh, Helen. I have next uh, Councillor Nathan. And again, thanks for the presentation. I think it's a good start. Um, but my questions are more related around, and, and I think Mike, you started kind of going over this, is what's the impediment? What's what's holding us back? Where are the challenges and, and how do we overcome some of those challenges? Um, you know, the, the, it's a big one in terms of the, the first one that Mike raised, which was access. Uh, I think that's, that's something we'll have to look at and, and think of ways to overcome. Um, going forward. Uh, and also, uh, I don't think our drainage committee is, is still up and running, is it? Um, something we'll have to look at, um, you know, for consideration on, on how to project manage all of this. And, and that's my third point. Uh, when I looked at the, um, uh, the flood damage centers, I could see I could see the formation of a strategic work plan on that, but I don't know where we we look at in terms of the priority vis-a-vis -vis the money that's been identified because my quick mass is we're, we're short to a couple million. Uh, I may be wrong, but that was just my quick math uh, based on the slides and how quickly we went through there. So there is the shortfall uh, because at the end of the day, something as, as significant as flooding and doing that mitigation work, I think, you know, it's uh, to me, it's not a menu. Uh, I think we have to do it all. And we have to find a way as a governing body to do all of that work. Um, so there's that aspect. And then um, I can't remember my last point, but uh, I'll, I'll put it in the chat if I do remember. But those are my comments so far. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan, for your comments. And yes, just to, just to clarify, um, obviously, that the drainage committee uh, was uh, in place during that time, so we'll have to look to next steps in terms of, um, you know, just Nathan to your comments of of that uh, monitoring or management of of the project itself. Also, looks you know continues to to highlight uh, the importance of um, not just even further, excuse me, government funding, but own source revenue. Right, and figuring those pieces out because you know, as we continue to maneuver through this presentation, it adds even further to the long list of needs in this community and what we have to do to uh, continue uh, to address those needs. Um, so again, I'm gonna go back to the speaking list that I have next. I have Councilor Michelle uh, in queue next. Thank you. And I apologize for being late and I may have missed this. And so this assessment was done back in when? 2000 and two times uh, 2015 and 2019 18 18 okay yeah. 2018 yeah well it's relatively recent so has there been any a subsequent assessment done i guess not right because it's only a year and a half oh so so I'll, i don't know chief hill i think i was going to compile the a response to all the questions or did you want me to speak to each of them because we didn't speak to no. Councillor uh, Wright's questions there. So. I, I appreciate I appreciate you questioning uh, process, and I I think uh, I think it's uh, okay for you to respond uh, individually okay. right after. Okay, so I will just uh, for Councillor Wright, I, I guess I would I would respond that um, yes, if you look at all of the house improvements, and then you talk you add on to that Boston and Rogers creeks, and the flood damage centers that are there. The, the quantum is larger than the application that was made um, because when that application was made, which is in 2015, 2016, 
we had only studied McKenzie Creek to that point. And, and then again, we prioritize the, the community works, if you will, as opposed to the individual house works. So that was, that, that's why the, the funding application was done the way it was. Plus there was a limit on the amount of funds that could be requested from the application at that time. So those are all good points, very, very clear thinking through the, through the presentation. But that's, that was the approach that we took to, to that project. Um, uh, Councilor Michelle, um, yeah, no, there hasn't been any further work on, uh, from our, our side, Michael may have, may have done some, some work through his, through his team um, with respect to some of the issues, but to, to our knowledge, no additional flood study work has been done or updates to, to the costs, et cetera. And actually, I had a community question, which is actually the same question that Nathan put in the chat was uh, the climate change a factor in, in these assessments, in the assessments. Sure. So with, with, with respect to climate change, so when Don was presenting, one of the first pieces of, of information that we collect when we do a flood study is we assess the amount of rainfall and runoff. And we did do a climate change assessment for this project. So we did look into the future. And, and looked at um, what's basically a, com a combination of 50 different climate change models. And we looked at the worst case scenario in terms of a future climate change impact on the amount of rainfall and therefore the amount of flooding that would occur in, in all three of the water courses that we did study. So yeah, we did have a look at climate change as part of the original work. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jim, for your response. And I, I, I agree with uh, Michelle and uh, Michelle and Nathan in relation to the climate. I mean, we see what's happening across the, the globe, really. And, and, you know, even this country of, as latest to, you know, British Columbia and flooding and so forth and the impacts it's had on some of the First Nations territories within that province. So I think it's an important piece. I mean, we even see uh, what's happening with, you know, climate itself, even here, I'm sure even our farmers on, on Six Nations can attest, you know, to the amount of rain and, and crop and so forth. So it's only going to get worse. So the, the best we are in a position to be prepared, uh, I think is, is, you know, the vital work that we have to do as, as the governing body. Um, I'm gonna go next to Councillor Hazel. Yeah, I would just like to um, ask if part of um, the um, drainage review did it include the government ditches that run throughout? Just had a question from a, a person in my area the other day and said, why, does, why doesn't anyone keep those government ditches cleared out? Because he said there, there's so many old trees fallen in there. Uh, there's a lot of um, beaver houses that are causing a lot of uh, problems in terms of flooding, etc. Every every flow of water has its tributary, and where does it um, where does it run to? Like I, I guess, like the bottom line was his question was if do you attend it to that? Would our um, flooding and drainage problem be as bad, as bad as it is if all of those uh, ditches were opened up to, to work the way that they're supposed to? So that's a very good question. Um, to, the, to your second point about cleaning out of ditches, if they are in fact municipal or government ditches and their intention is for, for drainage um, and not a natural stream where you wouldn't want to be disturbing the that mm -hmm. natural habitat in there. But if their intention was for drainage, like a government drain would be, then um, yes, by all means, by keeping them clear and clean, they will flow and will have more capacity to, to transfer water from one point to another. So that, that's a very, very good question, very good point. So Don, with respect to the study, we did look at those if you wanna to speak to the, the government drain, drain portion of our study work. Uh Yes, we did. We, we looked at uh, doing a combination of uh, uh, things. And one of them was to, to walk far enough downstream to get a starting point and then reline the whole ditch system so that uh, we could end up getting a, 
a little bit more grade in areas where where it was so flat that you, you, the water wasn't moving. Mm -hmm. So, for example, with the, the first uh, project on on third line, uh, we went 700 meters downstream in order to start digging. We and uh, from the lidar, we were able to to tell exactly what we needed to do. And then we then we ran a, a new ditch slope all the way back so that we could put in deeper culverts and and reduce the flood flows uh, for all the residences on either side of the road. Thanks, Tom. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you for that. Uh, I do uh, also. I'll I have a couple more speakers uh, left, but I also want to acknowledge even in the chat. I know obviously this, there's there's some of the comments. I think the last one was from from Wendy uh, in relation to like this seems like a band aid solution, and I I have to agree with her comments in this in that sense. I mean we do understand that there's this is going to be big costs to do this work, but I think we need to have a more uh, a, a more a more wholesome plan uh, to move forward with these. I think that's the other um, you know the other kicker here that we have to continue to look for fun and we know funding is always going to be the issue right but if we look to priority what are pri like prioritizing i think that's something that we need to also uh you know, look to i'm going to go over to wendy and then i have sherry lynn in follow-up you may next please pardon oh sorry i have uh wendy as the floor and then sherry lynn and then kiri uh, yeah thanks and you know, I, I certainly appreciate that it takes time to do this work, but, you know, it, it almost seems like by the time it comes forward, it's somewhat outdated. I mean, because of changing environments, climate change, number of factors going on, just even with the, the infrastructure and the construction that takes place in the community, right? Because you're moving soil, you're digging, you're building facilities, all of those things. And it changes the pattern, it changes the landscape as well. So keeping up to that and keeping pace with that. And for those who, who you know, can't access the chat, I said, it feels like a Band-Aid on a geyser because, and that's why I asked about the plan early on. If there's 500,000 and the cost is, is much greater to do this work and it doesn't even cover everything, I mean, what do you do first? So we do some work, you know, in some areas doesn't include the home, doesn't include this piece. So we're doing almost a bit of a patchwork and will we get an eruption someplace else in the community? I mean, I, I know where I live. I mean, I'm surrounded by, by flooding, right? Swales front, back, all over the whole neighborhood. And that's not in the mapping sequence, but it exists. So how do we address those changes? So I'm looking for what's the action that's needed today? Like what, what decision are you looking for to move this forward? And it has to be some sort of sequential plan. And I haven't seen that because otherwise we are absolutely doing that Band-Aid work. And I think we need to stop doing that and lay out how are we going to approach this so it just doesn't cause more damage. Sure. So I can so if I can answer that question through you, Chief Hill. The 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 point about um, it being a, a band aid. Of course, it's going to be limited to the amount of funding that you're able to get, unless you have five million dollars that you're able to spend. Um, so and, and if you can get that funding, then you can do everything. But you didn't you didn't you don't have that funding. You have a million dollars or seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So we focused on those areas that provided the most bang for the buck. So you ask about prioritizing. So when Don walked through the process of benefit cost analysis and he identified a project that had a benefit cost analysis of 30 versus one that had a benefit cost analysis of one, well, certainly you would prioritize if you had to prioritize from a funding perspective, you would prioritize that project with a benefit cost ratio of 30. That's really the purpose of doing those benefit cost ratios is to identify those projects that give you, gives you the best bang for the buck in terms of addressing a flooding issue if you're limited by the amount of funds that you have. If you have unlimited funds, then it's not a problem. You can do everything. But if you're limited by funds, then that's how you prioritize your, your projects. And that's outlined in all of the reports that have been provided to you previously. In terms of 
um, things being outdated? Not so much because when we look at this, we look at the regional storm. The regional storm is, and this in this area is Hurricane Hazel. So that's a storm that has a return period of, of greater than one in 500 years. So that's the, the period of, and that, that isn't, that probability might change a little bit, but it's not changing drastically. So that those projects identifying the flooding areas and then the, the ways to address those projects, uh, or excuse me, those problems, um, don't really change significantly or drastically. And because we've included a climate change component in, in the, the uh, assessment of the flows, uh, we're actually looking into the future as opposed to looking into the, into the past in terms of storm drainage issues. If there's local flooding issues, yeah, those wouldn't have been included. Those wouldn't have been included in the study because they looked at the water course itself. So sorry, I wasn't looking for you to defend your the work that no. you've done. I was looking no. for us as a community. There are bigger issues. This is much bigger than even what you've presented is what I'm talking about and the plan. So if we're looking, when I set a Band-Aid on a geyser, if we do this little pocket and right now there's 500,000, not even the 750, 500, and we take from the list you have, even if we look at the FDC CO Schwiegen, we can only do a portion of that. So if you're, if we're hearing that, if we do these four items and partial on one of them, that's not gonna cause problems someplace else. So this is the absolute first step that we should doing, be doing in the whole plan that's gonna help us to cut off and stop some of the issues overall. That's what I wanna know. That's what I want the yeah. to hear. Or should we be doing some of this in some of the other areas? Well, is that a better idea to do that planning so that we're not cutting anything off? Sure. And, and so I'm looking at the bigger picture. So this is more for, you know, back to council. I understand. Now this yeah. is what's on the table. So not to defend the report. Yeah, yeah. No, sorry. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to defend. I was just trying to say that that's sort of the process that, sorry, I'm sorry if it sounded that way, but that's the process that we are, that we went through, I guess, to, to arrive at that. It's not perfect, but there is a way to prioritize projects. I would say also to your one point about, if you do this project, will you have a problem somewhere else? So we looked at that when we looked at the mitigation projects, we assessed what impact that would have both upstream and downstream. And we, we uh, determined those projects that um, or identified the solutions that would not have an impact upstream or downstream in terms of negatively impacting flooding in either of those locations. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for your, your questions and responses. Uh, again, going back to the, the speaking uh, order I have uh, in queue next, Sherry Lynn, Councillor Sherry Lynn. And I guess, yeah, I agree with uh, Wendy and, and the rest of my colleagues also. But the part of it is now, now it's out in the community right now. The questions is going to be, and they're probably thinking about it, you know, their houses might be flooding or there's, there's floods. Who can they contact? Now we brought this out. Where can they call or who can they contact? I guess that's my question for them to, for, um, for us to let the community know. Chief. Regarding okay, if it's you, Harvard uh, or if it's their home or whatever to, to, um, to discuss. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that, Sherry Lynn. And I think that's something that we'll have to look to uh, with our, with our uh, Director of Public Works. I know Mike, Mike here on the line. Uh, perhaps maybe we establish, you know, a more again, uh, a fulsome plan or and what our plan, our next steps are going to be. But in addition to that, a, a communication strategy to community, so that you know we can be able to get to, uh, you know, the the homeowners' concerns on some of these these issues as well. Um, so, Sherry Lynn, I guess to answer your question, uh, we'll we'll have to do some more planning on our part, uh, just to determine. Uh, you know the right the right person uh, so that we're getting in all these concerns and issues and, and can start to compile and address them. <clears throat> if I could add uh, to that, Chief, Chief Hill, just sure. to your, your point, I think it's a a great one that you know if you're if you're bringing this to the community and as you mobilize the community, um, you know with the events that occurred in BC and uh, across the country since we've done this study in terms of flooding issues. Uh, I think you're going to see that more funding is going to start to become available from the government. And, um, and if you can show a concerted and, and um, 
combined effort from the community to say this is a this is important to us to address. I think the more funds would become available to you, as in our experience. Yeah, and, and thank you for that. And I think that's exactly the route that we should be taking in terms of you know that that fulsome plan. Uh, so that we can, you know, be able to to say that we're we're prepared to do this work, uh, and can really start to advocate government to assist us in actually seeing it through and getting it done in a timely manner, as opposed to waiting and, uh, you know, when things get get worse. Uh, I have uh, Councillor Kerry uh, next. Yeah, my last. Um, I, I was just going to say after what happened out in British Columbia. I, I just wonder if the feds would consider freeing up more money that could be available for the damage that is going to happen or does the damage have to happen first? That, that was, I thought maybe the feds could, we could find out if the feds would be freeing up more money to be, uh, that we could access. Yeah, instead that's definitely doing, something that instead, we could. Instead of doing a Band-Aid job. Great, and I appreciate your your comments. I think we're all talking the same language, and can definitely uh, you know look to from from our office uh, on this piece as well. Obviously, in conjunction with our director of public works, the environment uh, committee or task force, uh, you know, and we'll look to again have a, a more fulsome discussion after this and next steps and where we go from here. Uh, I had Nathan, uh, Councillor Nathan, in queue next. Chief, I just put it in the chat. I was just agreeing with Wendy on the, the wholesome plan and let's, let's get going before this gets worse. Agreed. Okay, so I, I do believe, again, we're all speaking the same language and do want to, uh, again, uh, really appreciate uh, the follow-up uh, to uh, to full council on this on this matter uh, and really look to uh, next steps, best next steps on, on how, to, how to best proceed here. Is there any further questions or comments? Uh, Sherry Lynn. We got a timeline on this to let the community know. A couple weeks, week. Well, with all the competing priorities, it's hard. <laughs> I know I keep saying this. <laughs> There's like everything seems to be a priority one. So priority 1.12 here. <laughs> uh, I think we all, you know, we'll have to uh, look to and get and get back to to that, Sherry Lynn, to that point. I've made a note here uh, and to work with uh, with our staff uh, and to, uh, again, have um, a more a fulsome plan and where we go from this point. So uh, if you can leave that, I think, uh, with us for now until we can further follow up, uh, you know, on next steps in, in exactly those questions that you're what you're asking. Are there any further questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, uh, just looking to how uh, council would like to best proceed. I think at, the, at this point, uh, we could just accept as information at this time, I think, or unless we wanna attach even a, a next steps plan. But I think uh, if we can still have uh, the opportunity to go back with our teams, our, our staff, uh, and to really look to that fulsome plan and where we go from this point uh, might be the better option, I think, in terms of next steps. I see Helen has her hand raised. I just wanted to say that I think it kind of fell off the, off the radar when the drainage committee no longer exists. Remember, Chief Councillor Carl Hill was hitting up the drainage committee, and I think maybe... Um, Charlie Wayne or Ray or some either one of those might have been sitting there. Yeah. Well, none of them are with us now, so that's kind of why it kind of fell off the radar because we don't have a drainage committee anymore to speak of. So we would have to set up a drainage committee if you want to continue with doing that. Yeah, with only nine councillors now, we had 12 councillors back then. Yeah, that's another point, a good point. But I think you're right too. You know, the other piece too is I know just with uh, with Nathan, Council Nathan as the chair of environment. You know, we've been put, we've been putting a lot of things on that on the task there, the that committee itself. And you know, I would hate to see even another item. So 
uh, you know, to, to bombard the committee because they're already so busy. And that was, you know, we had just, uh, you know, created that newly environment committee this this term. Um, so I think you're you're right, Helen. You, you know, we may have to look to you again if whether we uh, re-engage or, uh, or re-implement rather uh, the the drainage committee uh, so that this can they can take this all of this work on. Because there, there's there is a lot of work I think involved in this, especially when we talk about the more fulsome plan. Uh, I, I see uh, Wendy has her hand raised. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, I, I was I was looking for a bit more action. So, <laughs> if if we can move forward, certainly that plan. I think we need to do that very quickly, and I'm hoping whoever's leading this of it's under Mike Shop or, or others. I was gonna shoot it over to environment because it seems to fit. But uh, I, I'm, I'm concerned because Don made a comment and maybe I just misunderstood him when he talked about the federal funding, provincial funding, the 250 each. And then I almost picked up that it was contingent upon Six Nations funding. Is that the case? So we don't get the 500 unless we put in are 33 percent so we have to come up with 250,000 or we don't have the five either so that's maybe step one of the plan step two of the plan is to look for the other um you know four and a quarter million so that we can finish this work that we have to do right but if we need a motion to at least look for the 33 percent so that we can get the 500 maybe that's a step one and we can action that tonight and I'll move on that if that's the case. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Wendy. There's a motion on the floor. It's moved by Wendy. Is there a seconder to that? Second by Michelle. Uh, further questions, comments, Nathan? Yeah, I was just gonna comment that uh, there's certainly don't mind tacking on to environment a little bit more. We've already been doing a bit of work on this. Um, and uh, I, I think to the other thing about um, when we do this work, and, and I'll look to Darren to this, is there's also the, the route we could take of, you know, utilizing the environment community to run through, still reporting to council, but, you know, hiring, you know, project managers and consultants as we need, as we need to, um, as well as ensuring that, you know, step one, I think Wendy's right, we got to ensure that we have the resources first and foremost. Um, but also, if we need more bodies, then, you know, there's, there's lots out there that can do this type of work. So um, I don't think I need to put any of that in the motion. I think most Wendy's motion speaks for itself, but I just wanted to comment that I, I think environment can handle this as well. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Nathan, and appreciate that. Uh, okay, is there any further questions or comments to the motion on the floor? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Uh, seeing or hearing a motion is carried. Uh, so we'll look that, to add that to the action item list and follow up on that step one and then also look to the more fulsome plan on how we're going to uh, you know, look to get the rest, uh, the remaining of the funding in order to do that work. So uh, again, Jim, I'd wanna say Nyawa and thank you uh, for joining us and Don uh, this evening and, and following up on this presentation. Again, it's important important work and so we'll, we'll definitely look to how we um, we can do this uh, in a more timely manner as well uh sorry wendy you have uh your hand raised do you need a second reading on that yeah so i was gonna actually uh, grab a second reading and you, you're willing to move second reading move by wendy seconder second by sherry lynn oh sorry michelle <laughs> uh all in favor any opposed? Seeing or hearing on motion is carried. Um, I'm just getting a question in from the community. Are community members allowed to be a part of the environment environmental committee? Uh, I think at this point in time, yes. <laughs> we need as much help as possible from community. So if there are you know, volunteers and individuals who are uh, expressing interest within uh, the environment committee, by all means, I believe, uh, Councillor Nathan is the chair of the committee. You know, we could be uh, contact uh, him as well if, if you have interest uh, or rather even the chief's office and we'll look to direct uh, where best. Uh, sorry, Nathan, uh, I see your hand raised. 
Yeah, one of the things we were hoping to do for November, but we're, we're getting bombarded with dealing with issues as well, was do a, a full kind of environmental scan on environment for the community, and then do that outreach to the community to say, hey, here's the here's the committee, here's how you can participate, and um, and 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 whatnot. So um, that's likely coming um, probably more so in the new year now. Um, uh, but uh, definitely that that piece is coming out to to ensure that we have community involvement and we do the the, the outreach to say here's what we're starting and here's the work that we've done so far so communities up to speed and then um, take it from there that's perfect thank you uh thank you so much for that nathan uh okay uh again wanted to say uh, nyawa and thank you for for joining us this evening uh, Jim and Don, and look forward to our next steps here uh, and where we go from this point. Thank you very much. And, and to you, Chief Hill, if if uh, Nathan would like a deeper dive into the work that we did through Michael, we're, we're more than happy to uh, to do that. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you and have a great evening. Bye for now. Hey, Council Move. Moving on uh, to our next agenda item, which is the adoption of the General Council minutes of November 9th. I'll move. Moved by Michelle, seconder. Second by Helen. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing that motion is carried. Uh, our next item, which is a recommendation from our emergency control group. Uh, the recommendation is there. I do believe we have members uh, of the uh, emergency control group, our chair, uh, Michael uh, Montour, as well as uh, Travis Anderson uh, is on the line to help and assist in answering any questions. Uh, so looking to uh, Mike, we also have our Lacey from Public Health, I see on the line as well. Uh, so maybe perhaps, maybe uh, Mike, if you can introduce the recommendation uh, and then we'll look for uh, mover seconder for their uh, deliberation. Good evening again, everybody. Um, so the uh, Director of Federal Schools, Travis Anderson had presented a proposal to the uh, incident management team, which is the, the table of health experts that inform and recommend items to the emergency control group. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll let him speak more to his recommendation, but it's fully supported by both the incident management team and the emergency control group. Travis. Oh, sorry, Travis, you're still, uh, you're still on mute. Oh, sorry about that. Perfect. Uh, say, say, well, uh, I'm not sure if you wanted me to present or just go over uh, uh, this kind of the the proposed plan. Yes, I think I think just to add to the recommendation as is there on the agenda. So uh, if we could look to uh, you know the plan, uh, and if there's any questions that arise from that, we'll go from there. Okay. So along with that, I'll take over the screen. Is that okay if I take over your screen? Sure. No for that. Let's see if it worked. Screen is sharing. Travis Anderson Greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Travis Anderson. I'm the director of federal schools. I'm looking at, and I'm happy to be here tonight. Uh, I'm looking uh, to just kind of move on to the next uh, steps with our reopening plan. Uh, we have, uh, oh, sorry, I went too far. And schools as safe as possible. Uh, we work in collaboration with Lacey Benevery, our acting nurse in charge. And uh, uh, now Mike for the introduction there. Emergency control group. We work with the incident management team and also the PAC group, our principal advisory committee, in collaboration and uh, approved by each uh, 
organization and group. So the proposed change in 2021 to a, a full reopening, that's where we combine our cohort A and cohort B, uh, which uh, currently now cohort A is coming Monday, Tuesday, and alternating Wednesdays. And our cohort Bs are uh, Thursday, Friday with alternating Wednesday. So the plan is to bring them all back together. Uh, there would be an option for cohort D. This is new. This would be an online academy. Uh, it would be a district class and asynchronous learning. Uh, this is different than our current cohort C. Uh, our cohorts uh, for this to continue, cohort C then would be would specifically address COVID-19 related protocols. Uh, so, for example, to kind of explain how this would work is if a class is uh, uh, considered uh, high risk and they need to high risk contact, need to uh, close down uh, for for two weeks or isolate, they would move into a cohort C with their teacher. Um, and anyone that would be, say, if there was a bus that was also considered high risk, uh, those students would then zoom in with still their current classroom uh, on any kind of uh, COVID-19 related protocols, they wouldn't be moved to the online academy. The online academy is, is going to be totally separate. Um, so they would be actually pulled from their rostered school um, and not with their regular classrooms like what it is now currently in cohort C. Uh, the idea is to, to have the students in front of the teachers uh, um, and that be their focus. And then we'd try to support the ones that are, are choosing to stay remotely uh, through this online academy. Uh, we're going to continue with the masking uh, dividers. Uh, we have dividers for each student and uh, they'll be up during lunches. And then when there's pr uh, close proximity teaching, uh, the dividers will be up um, along with their masks. Uh, the, and they will wear their masks 100 percent of the day, except for mask breaks and for when they're eating. Uh, we're going to promote physical distancing when when possible. Uh, and we've already uh, reopened our gyms uh, so the gyms are so we're starting to lessen some of the restrictions uh, just trying to make it uh, more enjoyable for the students uh, and enjoying school a little bit more and uh, feeling a little bit uh, more normal uh, we'd be planning on December 3rd uh, 2021 as a transition day so that'd be a PD day and now to give this uh, staff uh, opportunity to prepare for the return of students on the Monday for full return we're gonna continue with the continued uh, safety continued here with our uh, mass breaks throughout the day. There's still no school sports. Uh, there's no assemblies and no field trips and no shared spaces, but uh, we're trying to, to uh, lessen some of those restrictions uh, with the guidance from Oshigan Public Health. Um, so some of those may change in, in especially as we move into January, February, into the new year. Those would, uh, there, we, we meet regularly, we meet every week uh, to discuss uh, uh, what kind of the guidance is out there because it's ever changing. Uh, and then we adjust to that. Uh, we'll continue the land-based learning outdoor settings as much as possible. Uh, essential staff only within the schools, it would be a controlled entry. Focus on hand washing procedures and guidelines. But we are gonna have a new wellness agreement signed by parents prior to the students attending um, because there will be some edits to that and changes. Um, and we'll continue with daily screening at home for students and staff. Uh, masking from K to eight for students and staff. We provide three masks a day and PPE for staff. Uh, continuous evaluation of uh, the reopening plan. Uh, we follow guidance of Australian Public Health, IMT, and and ECG. So what we'll, what have we learned so far? We've learned that uh, 8.75 of our student population are in cohorts, the current cohort C in our in our model, current model. Uh, so that's 94 out of 178 students. Um, there's been four COVID alerts issued to the schools. Um, there has been no community school community spread of COVID, and federal staff right now is currently at 97% double vaxxed. Uh, safety measures are working, so it's uh, we feel that's safe and. And now is the time to increase capacity um, was uh, the recommendation and also navigating cohort C for closures and that will continue so that I think uh, I, I, I do have Lacey even every on the line and she'll she's going to go through the next slide to kind of cover some of the, the terminology, um, especially when we have COVID alerts and, and a little bit of discussion of, of some of the terminology. Uh, so improved, we've improved our contact tracing procedures. We've worked in collaboration with Oshwigan Public Health to be able to, uh, to, be able to straighten out some uh, contact tracing issues. Um, and it's uh, ever-changing and, uh, and we look to uh, improve those uh, measures all the time. Uh, students are demonstrating extensive growth in uh, in-person learning. Um, 
and also communication between Ashwigan Public Health, IMT, and ECG is very strong, uh, and that's key in, in helping us navigate through the guidance and the different ever-changing environment. Um, I think here, this is where I'd like Lacey to kind of give us a little context here on, you know, what is a, a COVID alert? Um, Lacey, are you on? I know everyone, I'm here. Okay, thanks, Travis. Um, oh. For the COVID alert, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, for, for the COVID alert, so basically what that means is if we identify a student um, who has tested positive, we will notify the school that has been affected as well as get in contact um, with the busing routes for that. Um, basically, it's a communication that goes out uh, for the parents to notify them that there has been a COVID positive person in the school. Um, and then notification that the classrooms that have been affected, they will be notified of any potential exposures. Generally, with the measures that we have in place with these COVID alerts, um, uh, the risk of exposure is very low um, in most cases. Um, however, they are certain individuals who are deemed high risk contacts just based on the circulating variant that we are dealing with, the Delta variant and the contagious, contagiousness of it. So that's why we have to isolate those individuals as soon as we know. And there is a, there is a time lag in between um, a COVID alert and notification as we sort out the details. It's not an immediate thing. So I know alert seems that, you know, it, it's, it's an immediate response. It's an immediate response that we do as soon as we find out. Um, so oftentimes there's questions that come into our office and, you know, we, we manage it with the information that we're provided. Um, so generally we have our communication pathway a lot stronger now than we did at the beginning of the year, simply from the lessons that we have learned so far. And I feel it's, it's a, it's a fairly, um, it's a fairly good process that, that we've created here. And then when we look at the terminology with regards to an outbreak, I think this is something that we have to get used to hearing as we get in further into um, COVID and increasing our measures here. An outbreak is simply um, terminology that there is transmission in the school. We haven't had and we haven't had that happen yet, um, but I'm not saying that it's not going to happen. We're dealing with um, a population that is currently unvaccinated and you know the, the risk of transmission is, is higher with this Delta variant in that population. So <clears throat> I think it's getting comfortable with hearing outbreak in some of the communications that we will have to send forward. Um, schools can operate within an outbreak and it's basic, it's just a term, uh, public health terminology that we, that we use just to signal that, you know, we got to really keep our eye on, on this location. Um, the next point, when we look at the school closures, that is a decision that is not going to be taken very lightly. We will look at all of the parameters around what school closures mean. Um, and we really don't want to get into a situation of a school closure if we don't have to. So I think we're, we're still learning a lot with COVID right now and with the guidance changes that happen, like Travis said, almost daily sometimes, you know, we, we really consider our planning. Um, we do a risk assessment and analysis with each change in the plan. And, you know, Travis is well aware of the capacities that we are at and, you know, we, we are in constant communication with ensuring, you know, the, the health and safety of the school setting, as well as, um, you know, making sure we're not unnecessarily introducing risk into the environment. Um, and then looking at the vaccinations for those five to 11. So it's almost like we're, we're 
going into this with this added um, layer of protection with vaccination. So as of November 19th, Health Canada approved the use of Pfizer vaccine for those aged five to 11. And we are working to offer clinics to uh, this age population. Um, we have a date set aside for November 26th and, and December 3rd. And those can be booked by calling the vaccination call center 226-227-9288 and booking an appointment. Um, we understand there's some hesitation for uh, vaccinations in this age population because it is a, a younger population. And we feel that, you know, this is vaccinations and what we're seeing in the adult population in terms of COVID, it's lessening this, the severity of illness if anyone comes in contact with COVID who's fully vaccinated. So they are essentially working. Um, there's a lot of good data around those in this age population um, in terms of protection. Um, there's going to be mild side effects as with any vaccination. And yeah, I think that's all I have. Unless yeah. I'll turn it back to you, Travis. And, yeah, well, Lacey, I, I know I added the extra slide in there at the end, the uh, vaccination approval for five to seven, I think, yeah, or five, uh, five to 11. Uh, so our next steps, we're looking to communicate with parents if, if this is uh, this, our steps are approved and uh, starting to communicate with the parents and letting them know the process for, uh, you know, registering for our online academy. Uh, we're looking to update our reopening plan, which is on our website, and then also uh, getting the new wellness agreement signed by the, by the parents. So those are our, our next steps in, in moving forward, if, uh, if that's what uh, the community would like. Uh, let's stop sharing the screen here. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nyawa, so much, uh, Travis and Lacey, uh, for uh, providing uh, your, your presentation and comments. Uh, I do, just before I get into uh, questions and comments, I do have a couple uh, coming in from community. Uh, first one is, does the new or amended wellness agreement have to be signed by all full-time students before they attend and when will these forms be made available for parents to sign and be forwarded to the Sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, but I think I've heard everything in the question. So now for the question, uh, the new wellness agreement will need to be signed. Uh, we have, we've been making edits uh, as we, uh, as each of the guidelines have changed a little bit, uh, part of it in the screening, uh, temperature taking, uh, different things have changed. So we want to update that. And yes, it would need to be signed before that first day of uh, full re, uh, full return on December 6th. And that would be getting out as, as soon as uh, uh, probably this week, uh, getting out as soon as possible to start getting these uh, signed. Okay, thank I you. Agree. And then also too, just uh, just another question coming in really quickly. So off the reserve, COVID cases are posted along with the date in school. Uh, why does Six Nations not post this data? So will we be getting into, I guess, more or less, obviously we we update our, our COVID numbers uh, when uh, you know information becomes available to do that. But say in the instance of schools, uh, is there uh, an opportunity to showcase uh, that data to community in, in the situation that we do have a confirmed positive case within the school? So I think Lacey will probably help me with some of this question, but uh, when, and when we have a, a positive case within the school, that is that COVID alert. Uh, that is a letter that's sent out to the entire school um, so that they're all informed and then they're contacted if, if they are considered high risk. Um, going out and, and advertising which classroom it is and, and uh, we're, we're on the, we have to be respectful of confidentiality. We are in a small community. Um, pieces can be uh, put together and people can start to figure out uh, uh, who that person is sometimes. So that, that COVID alert uh, goes out to all the, that school community. Um, that's how we inform them. Uh, Lacey, did you want to talk about uh, confidentiality at all or did I cover it? 
Uh, yeah, just with regards to posting that information um, publicly, I know there was a discussion at IMT and ECG group at one point where we, we decided we would not post that uh, just for the um, potential for um, discrimination in those school communities, as well as like Travis mentioned, the possibility of, of figuring out who cases are. Um, we still respect privacy and confidentiality when it comes to COVID cases being identified. And if they wanna share that information, that's totally up to them, but that's not our job to share um, that type of information publicly. Thank you. Uh, thank you for providing your responses, uh, Travis and Lacey. Uh, opening up now the floor to you. any further questions or comments from council, I first see Helen has her hand raised. Yeah, I, I read the uh, that the, I knew they were going to plan on opening the schools, but today, in looking at our numbers, I'm very concerned mm -hmm. that we have 43 cases presently and there's 115 in isolation. It seems like our numbers are starting to climb again. Um, so I wondered if the numbers keep climbing, is the school still going to be opening on December 6th? Is it going to be based on the numbers? And I also have a concern too, because we seem to stop, we seem to have stopped telling the community to sanitize, to stay home, to distance, to get tested, to get vaccinated. The last few weeks, I haven't seen a whole lot of stuff going out to the community. And, and I know it seems like the community is just doing whatever they want. Um, I know they're having a big Christmas bazaar at I.L. Thomas or I.L. Arena. I think it's this weekend. People are having big birthday parties and people are fucking does. We're not... We seem to stop putting information out to the community to keep reminding them over and over and over. And, and, and I think that's partly maybe why some of our numbers are climbing so high. Um, so I have a concern with that. I don't know if it's gonna keep going high or it's gonna start going down. We don't know that, but I don't know how many of the 115 in isolation are gonna end up being positive cases. So, it seems to be the convenience stores are the only ones that are still following protocol. Still not letting everybody in the store and they're, they're telling only three people and, and, but everybody else seems to just do whatever they want. So I think we need to start promoting again, a lot of the stuff that we had promoted before about asking people to stay home and asking people to wash and sanitize and, I don't know. I, I, I'm not going to many places down here. I, I feel safer going to Bradford because we have so many cases and you don't know who's walking around. And, and another, con well, I have other concerns too, but I won't go into it anyway. Yeah, I think it's important that we start promoting again like we did before. And I question if we're going to open schools when our cases keep going up higher and higher. So I'll answer. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. sorry. I, I see a couple of people wanting to respond. I'll maybe first uh, I can begin with Travis and over to Lacey. Yeah, Nyao, Nyao for your uh, question, Helen, uh, and your insight. Um, at the schools, I know that we have germ squirt, or I call it germ squirt, but hand sanitizer uh, at uh, all the doors as they enter. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in the hallways in the schools and I see the students going to the bathroom. They, they clean their hands before they leave. They clean their hands as they come back in. They're wearing their masks. Uh, their dividers are up when they eat. And, and, and outside, uh, you know, they, they still wear their masks outside. So we do have a lot of safety measures in place. And, you know, it is a... Uh, I feel it's a, a controlled area where we can, you know, keep track of, of the safety measures that we do have in place. Um, I think, Lacey, did you want to, I think we might have spoke at the same time. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, sure. Thanks for your points, Helen. You bring up very valid um, concerns that I think we're all facing right now. And to be honest, it the students are doing amazing with the measures that we have in place and at the schools at this time. Um, the parents are doing 
an awesome job with ensuring that yeah. you know they're they're keeping their child home if there's any if there's any symptoms that they're experiencing they're picking their children up during school when there are um, symptoms presented during the school hours and you know that's really helping these um, cases from spreading within that school setting. The concern is the community transmission that we are facing right now. And in order for this to move forward, we really do need the support from the community to take COVID seriously yet. I know we are um, seeing regular interaction at our vaccination clinics as well with people coming in and getting their shots. Um, that's helping to keep our, to get our immunity up there to this virus. This, this virus at this time is finding those who are unvaccinated and making them making them sick. So it, it's been a challenge trying to get um, people to continue the efforts just because I think everybody is just exhausted from COVID at this time. And, you know, it, it's getting the messaging across. Um, there really has to be strong messaging for community to take this seriously and, and know that you know, we're doing everything we can to try and, and prevent COVID. We're providing the health teaching that we can at our office. Um, we have been met with some resistance from some community members, but in the grand scheme of things, it's totally up to this community as to how we carry forward through this pandemic. We're not quite over it yet, but we still have a bit of a ways to go. And in order to protect our children, you know, it, it is doing all of the things that you mentioned. You gotta take the symptoms seriously. I know there's there's always debate over like, there's no cold, there's no flu. Well, honestly, COVID presents as either one of those. And in order to rule out COVID, we need people to get tested for it. The other thing is the, the hand washing and making sure they're wearing their mask when they're out in public. It's the gatherings that are getting us in, into hot water right now. And, and you know, people thinking that going to um, a small gathering is safe. It, you just never know who can be a carrier there. And I, I feel that, you know, the messaging has been put out there over and over and people are aware of what they need to do. It's, it's getting them to do it at this time that's making it a, a real challenge because I think everybody is just at their wits end with this pandemic. But we're doing the best that we can with the schools and making sure that you know we have the measures to limit the risk of exposure within school. It's the exposures outside of school that's gonna create issues within the school. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Travis and Lacey. I think even too, just before I go to uh, Wendy and Carrie, I believe I have next uh, in queue, uh, is, you know, looking at, I know you touched a little bit on these pieces, Lacey, in terms of uh, individual responsibility. Um, but, I, you know, we've, we've constantly kicked out information uh, through comms. I know comms has another, um, you know, uh, round of, of communication, communique going out to community on this. You know, every Friday on the radio, I constantly look to, you know, the, the constant measures that are in place to, to follow public, the guidelines and so forth. But I think, you know, there's, the, there's also, you know, the other area of, you know, public health and looking to the third booster shot, looking to now the five to 11 ranges of clinics. You know, so public health needs to play, I think, a, even a, a bigger role in, in expediting uh, those clinics to also help in this, uh, you know, situation that we're in. Uh, but I think also too is is folks saying I know we've had this conversation here at council as well is um, and with community is is you know recognizing the the new norm in a sense you know at, at what point are we going to stay stagnant or go you know for this uh, for another two more years uh, do we you know or do we look to you know how we best move forward now with the you know with Travis I, I know uh, with your uh, presentation in terms of the measures that are in place uh, you know I, I think you know that and the other big piece to this is the mental health aspect I think as well uh, to this uh, to this issue and how we need to focus in on on some of those areas so I think we're all talking the same language language and trying to obviously still protect uh, the health and safety of all of our members. Um, so that's that's still a priority for all of us here and, and I think that's something that we'll always maintain as a priority um, but just wanted to offer some of the, uh, my comments as well. I'll shift over now to, I had Wendy next and then also uh, Carrie uh, following Wendy. Wendy, you have the floor. 
Thanks, Mark. And um, I'll start by saying I'm extremely frustrated by this conversation. And uh, I'll, I'll be very upfront about that. N number one, I've always said that this is a federal responsibility. We've not taken over education. So this, whatever decision lies with the school, what they choose to do, and they've got the plan. Public health is under ISC, uh, Indigenous Services Canada as well. So that's again on the, the federal side. But I do appreciate the conversation. Mm -hmm. you now, I, I looked at some of this work and I did some research and I looked at the research that's been, been done about children and youth. I mean, sick kids, they released a, a great piece of research about mental health, the correlation with being at home on the internet, anxiety and depression and everything that's settled in in, in mental health because of COVID and everything that's mm -hmm. going on. So certainly the need for kids to be in that that environment social interaction and, and having some of that structure in place so i certainly support that and i see the need because kids are, are are falling behind i mean i get requests from parents asking for letters seeking you know jordan's principal for silver for that extra help i get those coming in all the time so so they need that and and so i support that piece of it but certainly on the COVID side, I mean, the one thing that I found rather shocking when I saw the recommendation come through is that where's the vaccine strategy? You know, we've, we've known for a long time that it was coming down, children's getting, getting vaccinated. So where's that component of this entire plan because it's missing? I mean, that's public health immunization. That's been going on for, for years and years and years. So why that, isn't that a part of the plan? I mean, parental consent, absolutely all of those measures in place, but that should be a part of this, I would think, going forward. If we want to talk about COVID, if we want to talk about changing the way we live and addressing this, then we need to get, you know, more vaccinations. And I mean, there will always be a portion of the population, the community that doesn't want vaccines and that, that's fine. That's their choice. But we have to make sure that it's accessible. We have to make sure that the outreach is there. If it's if it's kids in school, if that's a measure and parents are willing to do that, then we should be putting all efforts into getting that done so that kids are protected moving forward. And, and parents and families as well. We know that there's trends in this community. When there are events, when there's something going on, we know that the numbers spike. We should be sharing that with the community so that they see the trends. I disagree that that can't be done. So I don't know who's making the decision of, of our staff that are saying no, but public health outside of this community shares that information and they have been all along this province, other provinces, you don't have to cross the line on confidentiality, but you can certainly share schools where there are cases. You don't have to give ages, you don't have to give grades, you don't have to give names. That doesn't breach confidentiality, but it shares communication with community. And we should be doing all of those things. That should be happening. The community wants to know. I mean, as far as I can say, I mean, we've given the information. Everybody knows social distance. Everybody knows wear a mask, get vaccinated if that's what you choose to do. Those are the measures. That's what's going to help combat all of this going forward. But, you know, we have to get rid of, you know, I've got elders who contact me and say they couldn't get through to public health. They couldn't make an appointment. They couldn't get their booster. They couldn't get their shot. And then they go to the health center at Ganyos and they stand outside in the cold trying to get in to ask a question, only to be told, call. You know, people who want to get tested, we, we can't do that. So, you know, we still have people standing outside of our health center to try and get in through a side door, making them stand outside in the cold. So we can do better. We are supposed to be providing services to community members. That's our job. So sorry, I'm on this rant, but we can absolutely do better. And if people are exhausted in their jobs, we as a council have tried to provide solutions. Every time we hear that, every time we hear that, you know what, we need this, we need that, we've made it happen. The last thing that came through is a vaccination coordinator. We got that position filled. We had somebody with extensive knowledge to fill that position and they were turned away because it wasn't time yet. So there's so many things that can be done. And if we don't have the resourcing in this community to make sure vaccines are accessible to everybody and on a large scale, not one at a time, not making an appointment, getting into the schools, going to places, getting this done on mass, you know, vaccinations, then 
we as a council, that's a political thing we can do. So let's get a meeting with headquarters. Let's get in touch with you know, the, the new minister and say, we need more public health nurses. We need a bigger division down here. We need to be doing all of this so that we can get this done because this is a public health responsibility. And if we can't get that through ISC, then let's contract that out through Brantford, through somebody else so that we can get the service in the community. But, you know, all of that to say, Travis, I agree that kids need to be in school. And this is my own personal opinion. And this is based on research that I've done and it's an interaction, but it can be done safely. And I like that that parents have the option of that, doing that work at home if they so choose. But, you know, it comes down to vaccinations. You know, that's what's really going to help us. You look at any study around the world, it's vaccinations, right? So. I mean, that's where our concentration has to be and supporting kids. We've said it before when others were on, we need the supports in schools. They need the tutoring. They need those resources. They need extra bodies in the classroom to help teachers, especially with the kids coming back. So more funding has to be made available to do that. So I'll stop there. Sorry for the rant, but as I said, <laughs> this is very frustrating for me. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for your comments. Again, there are a lot, a lot of great, great points made uh, within your comments. Uh, I want to uh, shift over now to Kiri I have next, and then Michelle. And could yeah. I be in line, Melba? I, I just had a concern with, uh, with the high positive counts today, but after... Lacey gave her explanation and Travis, uh, I, I'm satisfied with, with the recommendation. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Carrie, uh, for your comments as well. Uh, and I have next, I have Michelle and then uh, Melba. Thanks, Chief. And so what I wanted to suggest and Wendy hit a lot of it, um, so, I want to actually commend the schools, teachers, administration, nurses, everybody's done well. If uh, there was a case and, you know, the school community knew about it. So I do think that the option to put in front of us will continue to have um, safe schools. And I just wanted to touch on the fact that we can share the information with the community. I mean, my family was impacted. Grand Erie shared the information that there was a COVID case in, at, at one school. Nothing wrong with that. Community needs to know. And I think we need to get out of the this mindset that we are protecting people. Because I think when you, people know who has COVID, then, you know, they're actually very helpful. And, and that's what our community is all about. So I actually wanted to suggest to, um, we know the cases are going to go up, cold weather. Uh, we've gone through this already, right? So we have to get back to living um, with COVID because it's here. And so um, thanks, Travis, for your presentation. Yeah, Michelle. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle, for, for some of your comments as well. Uh, just before, I want to acknowledge uh, some of the comms uh, that are coming in from community in relation to uh, why council is still meeting virtually. I know Councilor Sherry Lynn has been bringing this item forward. We will be going back in person as well. <laughs> uh, so it's not the case of, well, we're all virtually and all school kids are going back to school. We're going to be meeting in person too. <laughs> so like, you know, I, I, know I would hate to see why it's all based upon just that one point. We're all going to be going back in person very soon. Over to you, Melba. Yeah. He's on next, Mark. Uh, I, I certainly have great confidence in that. Uh, Emergency Control Group, Public Works, and the school system. Um, I think uh, they've explained very well that the protocols and measures that that are necessary to attempt to keep each other safe. They're doing the best they can. So what they're doing is combining their care and safety of our children, which we expect them to do. We, we allow that to happen over the years, and we're happening now. I'm like Helen. I, I get concerned with the numbers uh, going up also in saying, how is this going to work? One of the things that I believe isn't in place, and I don't know how it would be done, you know how you go to a restaurant or you go uh, some of the other places where they 
question you in these, I think there's five questions. Well, there's four now, I guess, because possibly because we can cross the border pretty soon for 72 hours anyway. So we're not monitoring uh, those kind of things. Have you been in touch with a person who has COVID, for example? That's one of the questions. So we're not doing that part, and I'm wondering how that can take place. Um, that's one of the concerns I have. But overall, I, I, I really agree. I've mentioned that a long time ago, and I have the experience that that when, when you bring up kids and you're involved with uh, many, many areas mm -hmm. of the reserve, you know it's mental health. It's good. Mental health and, and socializing. We, it's not only children. It's, it's adults, certainly, that have been suffering. They say it to you. I need to be in touch with people. I have actually had that said to me. So I think you're doing a great job, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to certainly agree with, with what you're bringing forward, and uh, I'm going to have to wish you well, and I guess it'll come back if, if uh, things aren't working out very well. You're going to be monitoring very well in all areas. So thank you very much. I agree with uh, resolution. Thank you. No, Melba. I, yeah, I just wanted to comment because I know that there was some a, a bit of questions in that one in the in a screening tool that there is a screening tool that the parents uh, go through review every day before they send their child to school and, and same as the staff members. Uh, they have to report to the principal if they, if they can't to pass the screening tool. And uh, so now for your comments and yeah, it is about, uh, you know, the compassion and safety uh, for the kids. And uh, so now for your comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Melba and Travis, uh, as well, uh, for your comments. Um, I have next uh, in queue, uh, Hazel, uh, and then we'll look to uh, next, step if, next steps if there's no further uh, questions after Hazel. Hazel, you have the floor. Sure, thank you. Yeah, I just want to, uh, I guess, repeat what Melba said about the emergency control group and uh, public health and all of them, and that very fact of uh, statements like everybody's tired. I think the whole world is tired of this stupid pandemic. I think that's what that means. If if you could get up the next day and not have to worry about anything like that, it would be such a relief to all of us. I think that's where it's not so much people complaining in their capacities. People are just tired of that. For the children, uh, Pfizer just... Um, decided not long ago that they're gonna start vaccinating the five-year-olds and up. So I'm not sure if that vaccine is on site yet here at Six Nations, but I understand from what I was reading that it should be. Um, it's just efforts as they come along. It's like rapids in motion, motion. You don't get a clear picture at any one given point because things change. And I think we all just have to um, have mercy on each other because none of us liked what we've been exposed to and what we've all gone through. And I think if we just have patience and even myself with the cohorts now all binding together and going to go to school, you know, you then your mind starts playing tricks on you. You wonder, oh, that's going to open a door for your kids to get this um, COVID like you just keep as things change it creates some fear in your mind what that might do by doing that there are some people who think the school should just stay closed well we all know that that can't happen like we being realistic all of us just have to understand what each area is doing to to help our community get through this I just hope and pray that with uh, all the little kids going back to school together, that it'll be a good experience rather than anything else. And if they all start getting vaccinated, and I'm sure that data will be coming out soon because I don't think that vaccine is even here yet. But um, I think there was a date given from what I was reading. So I think we need to ease up and not be hard on each other, but understand that everybody's trying their best and that's what we all need to do. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Hazel, for your comments. I have Nathan uh, in line next. Yeah, thank you, Ethan. And thanks for everyone and their, their words on council. I, I echo. Um, the reason why I didn't really say much is, is because you guys were saying it all uh, in terms of the, the work and the recommendation going forward. I, I too agree with it. And um, with that, Chief, I'm, I'm prepared to move on that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Nathan. There's a motion on the floor uh, moved by Nathan. Is there a seconder? I'll second it, Melba. Second by Melba. And just really quickly for the community's sake, I'll just read uh, what the motion is. It reads that the emergency control group recommends to the Six Nations of the Grand River elected council support the federal school's transition plan to remove all cohorts and return to full-time in-person learning with the option of online academy learning effective December 6, 2021. It's been moved by Nathan and seconded by Melba. Are there any further questions or comments to the motion? I see Wendy has her hand raised. Yeah, can we just correct the writing in it? I mean, it's there, but just in terms of grammatical correction, the elected council support the federal school's transition plan. I mean, the plan says it all, right? We don't need the rest of it, just effective December 6th. Uh, I'm fine with that, no problem. Looking to the mover and seconder. Sounds great to me. Seconder. Sure, that's fine. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions or comments? Sorry, Mark. Okay, seeing, oh, sorry, Wendy? Yeah, not necessarily to the resolution, but just for information, uh, vaccines for five to 11 actually started today. So it was approved on Friday and kids actually from the, this community have bookings to get their shots already. Just so people are aware. I've seen that as well. Thank you for that information. Are there any uh, further questions or comments? To the resolution. It's been moved and seconded. If there's no further questions or comments, all in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Is there a motion to waive second reading? Moved by Nathan, seconder. Second, Melba. Second by Melba to waive second reading on the previous motion. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none motion is carried. Oh, sorry, Wendy, were you opposed? No, I just have a quick question. It was in the chat and I, oh. I should have raised it. Okay, sorry. Oh, sorry, are you, oh, sorry. I acknowledging Wendy's comment in the chat. Were parents involved in the discussion regarding reopening? Is that the one you're referring to, Wendy? Yes, yes. Okay, my apologies. So um, that's a question for uh, Travis. Uh, no, not in this process moving forward. Uh, I presented to council on uh, August 24th and had told the plans, the, stand, the, the next stages that we are going to be going to. Um, there was a, a comment of uh, survey fatigue uh, with parents and filling out con continuous surveys. Um, moving forward, it was a, a reopening plan with an option. So uh, through discussions at uh, PAC and our other committees, uh, it was uh, that we move forward with this uh, next step and then uh, with options for, for parents who still decide that uh, they want to stay remotely. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for that response. Uh, Travis, Wendy, did you have a follow up? Yeah, I, I just think, you know, this is a this is a big one. And, you know, w what I hear from from community members that outreach to me is that they do want that communication, they want to be involved. And I mean, you know, th anybody that has children, I mean, you want to know what's going on with them that impacts them. So, you know, consideration to maybe have that discussion as well. Yeah, we've uh, communicated the letters uh, yeah, at each point, uh, letting them know the next stages of, of what they're doing and then any questions to reach out to the principals and have those discussions. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Travis. Uh, sorry, Michelle, I see your hand raised. I just have three comments. I think in the end, to it's parents' decision. It'll be my decision um, to put my child back in. Um, I do want to pick up on what Wendy talked about, though, sending a letter off to public health for that assistance because vaccinations are key. But I also want to talk about um, now that students will be going back, we have a limitation on community organizations. I mean, at the arena, I can rent it, but only 10 people can go, but we can go put 25 kids in the classroom. So can we have that discussion too? Uh, I don't want to keep the director on the line or, or others. Sorry, or somebody watching cartoons? I'm not hearing Michelle, I'm hearing some. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, so the public health and then the um, the return of uh, opening up places under council. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry, Michelle, your first question was, to, is that to Travis? Is <laughs> that what you're referring no, to? No, sorry, thanks for that, Wendy. I'll, I'll start over, let's rewind that. Um, no, my first comment to Travis is, um, I do believe parents have choice. I apologize that you were listening to the cartoons and not me. <laughs> um, so parents will always have choice, I believe, and it's good that we the school has laid out options. Um, my second comment was Wendy had talked about sending a letter off to um, the Fed's headquarters in regards to getting more support for public health. So I wanted to pick up on that because I do think um, that support is needed. We continue to hear they're tired. So how can we help? Um, and then my next third comment was with students going back to school um, and, and counselors have always asked, when are we opening up? I know there's been some remediation of the building, but um, we also need to now look at all the buildings, all our council departments, because right now, even to rent the arena, only 10 people can skate. It's a massive arena. <laughs> our kids are out playing hockey all the time. Um, off the territory, so we need to now be consistent. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michelle, uh, for for repeating for repeating your your comments. I think they're they're uh, on point, most definitely. And I think we'll look to even I can speak to the last one uh, in relation to in our SEO on some of those uh, stipulations within our own buildings. I do agree as well, you know, we can work with the, ourselves at the, obviously our team uh, in conjunction uh, with, uh, you know, Lacey and others at Daniels to see what that additional support can look like from uh, ISC uh, in headquarters. Uh, and I, I think you made a, a, a really fabulous point to uh, that it still is parents' choice. So you're right. And, and thank you for, for raising that, uh, you know, if parents feel uh, that they do not want to send their kids back and they have to work. And I think that's the other piece, making sure that Travis, our educators, our staff uh, are working uh, with those individuals who choose not to send uh, their students back full time and that they have the, you know, the most support needed uh, as, uh, as they maneuver through uh, their decision and, and, and how uh, that looks and what rather what that looks like. Uh, mm -hmm. So thank you, Michelle, for your comments. We will we'll follow up on, on a few of them as well, uh, you know, through Darren's the office as well as from my office uh, on uh, the uh, public health piece as well. Uh, Wendy has her hand raised. Mark, could I speak? Yeah, I have Wendy and Q next, and then I'll go over to Hazel. If if Hazel is eager to speak, she can speak ahead of me. I'll wait till she's done. That's fine. No, I have no problem. Okay, I, I, all I see is whoever raises their hands first, whoever has it, <laughs> then I just go to that person. So Wendy had her Thanks. hand up first, Wendy get the floor, then I'll hand over to Hazel. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And I don't know how you want to um, direct the conversation, but yeah, certainly, I mean, my, I did background and because there's that, that alternative option for parents, so it, it lies with them and what they choose to do. But, um, you know, in terms of moving forward and and a political approach in you know expanding services here at Six Nations. Um, I don't know if we have a discussion about that, what that means. I mean, we did create that large vaccine plan 
um, a, a whole strategy that had a number of things. How do we get to that? How do we make sure that that's happening in the community? How do we make sure that the outreach is there? You know, what, what was the third shot, the booster that's in play, people are still getting their second shot. People still have yet to get their first shot if, if they choose. Well, now we've got children. I mean, those vaccines are, are rolling out. So how do we you know, do this in a large way? I know we had the Red Cross in that we did the max mass clinics and we got a lot of people out there. You know, we've raised before the, the mobile, mobile bus. Like how do we get that thing going let's get some gas in that uh in that bus and get it rolling and getting it out to communities and going to places so that we can do these vaccines and we can do the outreach and we can do all of those things um you know i'm really interested in having that discussion and what do we need to do like what is that plan so that we can get that implemented in this community and provide the service to community members. So I'm really interested in that conversation. Thanks. And, and I agree with opening up because we're we're doing hometown hockey. We're bringing it to our community and we've we've not opened up the arena. We've got a majority of, of the kids from this community and parents who are going off the territory to play, if it's hockey, if it's lacrosse or baseball, whatever they're doing, they're on teams outside of the community. So they have that interaction, but it's us. Um, and community members, we're holding community members hostage from our own services and departments. So I think we have to take a, a strong look at that. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks, Wendy, for for your comments as well, and we will get to uh, some of the more uh, of the pieces that you've raised uh, in, in further uh, on our next uh, meeting. I know we have Lori Davis Hill. Lacey has her hand raised. I'm sure that they could even uh, share some of uh, their um, their plans uh, in terms of some of the comments raised. Uh, I do have Hazel in queue next. Yeah, I just want to ask Mark. Um... And I think Helen asked today in an email, when when our council going to remove that orange, um, whatever you call it, when is that going to be lifted? Because I think that's sort of a, of a suppressant to anything getting past being allowing three people in a store or whatever. Doesn't that have to be uh, taken down first and then people can start um, kind of getting back to more normal. So if I can, I know we're, we're, we're jumping in on a few areas here of the conversation. I know it all ties into the bigger picture here, uh, but I want to have a more wholesome discussion specifically on this as opposed to just, you know, the unknowns and answering these questions. We're here primarily on the school issue at this point. So uh, I will look to the alert system, to the, the pieces that were raised with Wendy's comments. Um, and we will bring those items back forward to where we're going to next and what that means. So if we can uh, look to those pieces and, and provide and get the necessary support and resources so that we can have that more fulsome discussion. I seen Lacey had her hand raised. Thanks Mark. Just to some of Wendy's points there, I don't, I think you misinterpreted the tired comment that I made. I'm, I'm mentioning the general public is just tired of pandemic. You know, staff, they are, they are tired of dealing with pandemic as well. You know, and looking at our, our plans for vaccination, it, it almost sounds like you wanna force people to do something that they don't wanna do. And we are just simply making it available for people who are willing to come and get vaccinated. You know, there's there's no backup in this community in terms of a vaccination policy like we see in outside of our community. We see that in order to get into places, you have to provide proof of vaccination, but here that's that's not being that that's not being incorporated. You know, and then we had the vaccine coordinator, but unfortunately she quit on us. So, you know, it's really difficult to put somebody in a position when, when they're not willing to be there. So I feel that we are doing the best that we can with what we have to work with. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lacey. I'm going to, I'm going to close this conversation uh, because we're going all over the map at this point. There's not enough background information. We're going to alert system over to, to now the arena and how many people can fit in the arena. And I, I want to wait until we have the, all the information in front of us, but maybe perhaps since Lacey had mentioned uh, some of your comments, Wendy, I'll look to your uh, final comments and then I'm going to wrap this up because what we came here for, Travis, thank you for being here. We've done that business. Now it's time to move on. Wendy, you have the last comment. Thanks so much, much Mark. And uh, Lacey, I'd kindly ask you, please don't put words in my mouth. I'm not pressuring community to do anything, and I would never suggest that. But I do think we have to increase our outreach and make it accessible. And I think that is very fair, and that's what our jobs are, all of us. Um, so that's what I'm suggesting moving forward. And I look forward to the conversation because by making a motion to open up the schools and support that, I mean, that just blows the whole alert system out of the water anyway. So <laughs> because it goes against that, right? So um, yeah, we do need to address that. Thanks so much, Mark. Okay, thanks, Council. Okay, Travis, again, if, you, if I can uh, look to uh, yourself and, and if please uh, the educators and your staff, I know uh, Michelle made these comments as well, commending all of everybody because, you know, even to Hazel's comments, we're all in this together. Like, I, I don't understand half the time. It seems like we're all, uh, you know, at, at each other's throats at times. Uh, and, uh, you know, at times you could see it loud and clearly. And I think regardless of which, we still have to get through this damn pandemic. So I want to just say, Yawa, and thank you uh, to your, yourself for being with us this evening, uh, and as well to all of the educators, the staff, everybody in the schools that are continuing to keep our, our students safe, and as well as our overall community safe. So really appreciate the work that's being done, uh, and look forward uh, to uh, you know how this pans out in the case that it goes sideways. I know we've had our conversations, Travis, and we ultimately revert back to cohort systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's not mm -hmm. like an NPO, it's an ever changing environment. Mm -hmm. The comments yeah. have been made on these pieces. So let's move forward in the best way in a good way that we possibly can while keeping ins ensuring the health and safety of everybody. So really appreciate mm -hmm. that. Yeah, we'll go well. Okay, now yeah, what, well, Travis? Okay, Council, that, well, thank you so much. Uh, Travis, have a great evening. We'll, we'll continue to keep in communication and we'll, uh, and mm -hmm. we'll go from there. All the best and please stay Thank safe. You. Thank you. Okay, Council, have a great night. Take care. Uh, the next item on our agenda uh, is, is just in relation to political verbal updates. So I wonder, uh, Christopher, if I could just uh, touch base with you. I know that today uh, was the uh, Big Throne speech uh, and, and the governor, and I know you had sent out, uh, an email to, to Council. So maybe if we could just touch on that piece. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, as noted in the email, uh, today was the throne speech to kick off the 44th parliament. Um, it's the uh, third uh, parliament since uh, Trudeau's government came to power. Um, the main focuses were uh, ending the pandemic, uh, promoting economic recovery, addressing climate change, uh, and of course, reconciliation was another uh, major component of it as well. Um, obviously, this was uh, this was historic in a number of respects. It's Canada's first Indigenous Governor General, uh, Mary Simon, and she gave her uh, speech from the throne in three languages, uh, and I think that's the first time that's ever happened. Uh, so she delivered parts of the speech in Inuktitut, uh, which is her uh, native tongue. Um, so that was uh, that was certainly a historical aspect of that. Uh, she commented that. Uh, um, pursuing reconciliation is uh, a matter of pursuing truth and it has to be based on the lived realities of Indigenous communities. Um, they mentioned the government's commitments uh, to build a, to a new national monument to the survivors of the residential schools, uh, plans to appoint a special interlocutor who will be tasked with working on the government's responsibilities in the residential schools process. Um, bringing about a distinctions-based mental health and wellness strategy um, and uh, bringing in compensation for, uh, for people who were harmed in the child welfare system. Um, so there were a number of uh, things in the speech. Uh, it, it, nothing really new though. Uh, pretty much all of this was discussed during the, uh, the recent election campaign. It's taken a bit longer than usual to get to this point uh, of having a speech from the throne uh, given when the election was. And as noted uh, in uh, an email earlier to Wendy and, and Council, 
Um, we are expecting mandate letters at some point, but they have not been uh, issued yet, uh, or at least not posted on the Prime Minister's website or reported on. Uh, but once those are out, uh, I will send a, a heads up around as well. Uh, so that's that. And uh, um, yeah, I'll report more once, uh, once we know more. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Christopher, for providing that update. Yeah, well, uh, I'll, I'll now I'll now go into uh, just again. It was uh, our, our scheduling portion of the of the agenda, um, and just want to check touch base with Tammy on the line. Um, I know that there's a, a couple that need resolutions, particularly, uh, but the rest of them just need to be scheduled. Is that correct, Tammy? That's right. The first one you see that's there, that's just an open invitation. And so I, we realize that not every counselor is comfortable with going into public settings at this time. So if you can get back to me so I can give them back numbers on if they do want to participate, that would be appreciated. That's the one with the, the open house the, with, the, um, with Brantford and Brant on Tuesday, December 7th. And then we also have an invitation from, um, from, let me just see. We have an invitation from Environment and Climate Change Canada to have uh, a meeting. And so this, of course, we, we get a number of invitations like this. So they were proposing um, a bilateral meeting. And so I shared the information with council as well as with our Lands and Resources Office uh, last week when they, invitation came in and let you know that it would be coming forward. So it's just um, hopefully you have had time to review it. Just want to get a sense of whether or not you just want to move forward with that. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for that, Tammy. And then also just in follow up as well as the next uh, Development Corporation shareholder meeting is uh, tomorrow at 5pm. So you would have already received uh, that link for that for those of you who are joining for that. Uh, meeting and this is the one I think the next one is in relation to the resolution needed uh, we have put uh, beside there just as chair of the human services which is the patient and family advisory council um, which is meeting on December 1st uh, and so looking to a resolution and also maybe if I could just pause and check in uh, with Sherry Lynn to make sure uh, that she is still available and interested in attending uh, that meeting um, yes it's for the it's to be able to attend the whole the um patient and family advocacy council. So I won't be able to make that meeting because I have to chair human services. So um, I will be able to go if it's, you know, I'll let them know that that day is not good the first um, Wednesday of the month, but yes, I'm able to sit there. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, so just by, uh, in, on that piece, uh, I'm just wondering, Sherry Lynn, if you can, uh, if we can look to just, if we could just add your name there for now, uh, and then we'll look to next steps uh, after we, um, um, like for resolution, if that's okay. I want to check in with you again, Sherry Lynn. So I'm, so am I getting a resolution to sit there or no, or just yes. my, or, okay. No, yeah, no. Okay. So uh, that's. That's why, that's why I would still suggest even a resolution at this time. That way we have it on record. Um, and then we'll go from there if, if anything changes, even with your schedule or, or what, whichever. Okay. Yep. Okay. So that being okay. said, yeah, is there a motion for Sherry Lynn? Fine. I'll let them know. Hear me? Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Sherry Lynn. Uh, looking to a motion uh, for Sherry Lynn to set up the Patient and Family Advisory Council as Six Nations Council Rep. Is there a mover to that? I'll move it, Hazel. Moved by, moved by Hazel, second by uh, Michelle. Are there any questions, comments? Wendy? I had a question before that, but I'll wait till this is done. <laughs> okay, sorry. sorry about that. Any further questions or comments in relation to the motion? Okay, seeing or hearing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Uh, seeing our hearing on motion is carried. Can I get a motion to waive second reading? I move. Moved by Hazel, second by Michelle. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing our hearing on motion is carried. Okay, uh, Sherry Lynn, thank you. Uh, thank you for doing that. Uh, the following week, we have human services on December 1st, uh, as well as December 6th, general finance uh, and building an infrastructure leading into our next general council.
on December 14th. Um, so there's a few items that we'll have to look to schedule council and looking to your own schedules. I'll now look to Wendy, question, comment. Uh, sorry, Mark. So Devacourt, when these meetings come up, are they coordinated with council or are they just dates that are provided to us set meetings? Um, because I'm, I'm very interested because we, we are the only shareholder uh, to the organization. So I'd very much like to be there, but that's the standing meeting for the community trust. So, I mean, that, that date is out. So that's also booked well in advance. So I don't know what the coordination for that is, but I would think it should work around our schedules because we were the shareholder. Yeah. And if we can't yeah. be there as a shareholder, can we send proxies? Yeah. So that's a that's a really great great question. I think in terms of the quarterly meetings, we're already set. So, but we can still work with Roxanne. It's I'm, I'm, they've been pretty flexible uh, in those dates. Um, so we can they're definitely uh, you we can work with them to to uh, look at a majority date that works for everybody. Thank you. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the meeting's tomorrow, <laughs> so we won't be able to do it for this upcoming meeting, but. We will do it as on the future meetings, and that way it's a better coordinated approach. Uh, Helen? I will go to the Chamber of Commerce. Okay, the open house, December 7th. And then the second it, one, that the, the, this meeting, this bilateral meeting, I think this is part of that. Remember when me and Audrey got invited to that assessment meeting or whatever it was called? We didn't really know what we were doing. I think this is part of that. We're gonna, we're I had, I had sent an email of that, as far as I'm concerned, for me to be getting invited to this kind of a meeting, it's a little bit too technical for me. Yeah. There needs to be somebody <laughs> that knows what they're doing. I don't know if Audrey wants to keep, but I think it's part of it because it was that impact. Uh, the, they were looking, reviewing the impact assessment that time when I can't even remember what it was called, but anyway. But I'll go to the Chamber of Commerce. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Helen. Uh, I'll look to also follow up on those pieces that you've raised in, in relation to the bilateral meeting. Um, and I'll probably Michelle? attend the DevCore too. I can attend the DevCore one. Too. And I guess that, that was just my question. And it's good that Helen's going. I would go. Um, I know on oh, Saturday yeah. they were waiting for council. I attended 15 minutes late. And so um, I forgot. Yes. Yeah, so if someone can be there tomorrow evening, great, Helen. Yeah. So those ones usually, and I've, I've been attending the, these meetings, the shareholder meetings. For these ones, so I know the the other uh, uh, pieces that we've been taught and trying to talk about is in relation to the communication uh, and just council uh, responsive roles and responsibilities on those pieces. So we'll further uh, further that conversation tomorrow as well for those uh, who will be attending that meeting. Are there any further questions or comments in relation to the schedule? Okay, seeing or hearing none, I know uh, there was, uh, Nathan was experiencing some, some technical difficulties, but I just wanted to check in uh, with Shirley uh, and see if there were any new business items. No, there wasn't. Okay, thank you for that, Shirley. That being said, then that leads me to the adjournment of the open session as our mover. Moved by Michelle Seconder. Second, Hazel. Second by Hazel. All in favor? Favorite. Any opposed? Seeing or hearing none, motion is carried. Thank you all this evening for joining us for General Council. Looking forward to our next meeting with you live on Facebook. Take care and have a great evening.